And what is up, everyone? You, uh, we are live again. And uh, just real quick, uh, hold on. Um, we are doing this through uh, Discord style today. Uh, just for the sheer fact that I have not changed out of what I slept in, so I, <laughs> I didn't. Uh, I, I've been, I've been in it. I've been weird. I don't know. It's just, it's been one of those days where you kind of stay in this, but. Um, we got Landon Noel here today. He wanted to kind of come on our show to to discuss geeky things, and he gave me a list. And from that list, I'm like, uh, you, you kind of do realize who you're talking to. <laughs> it's like I don't know any of these things. I couldn't even come up with questions. So, a real quick story that I don't know if Landon knows, but it was kind of it's really funny. I know David knows it because we it's in the uh, the Asher co-hosts and David and Booze. We got a uh, little set chat we talk in on Facebook, and I know I told a story on, on air before, I don't know if, if Landon's ever heard it, but we 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 told we said like Landon's going to come on our channel, and um, Billy's like, who is Landon? And after everybody's just kind of mouth just dropped a little bit, we kind of picked up our jaws, we're like, all right, so we started naming us, uh, we said like Landon, you know, he's just, he does this, he does, does all these great things, we started listing off the things that you have done, and Bill, one of the Billy's roles on the channel is to talk to crazy people. He's talked to uh, Von Helton. He's talked to Nephilim Free. So he kind of doesn't trust us already. <laughs> yeah. uh, so he was like, is this like a Von Helton thing or is this true? And we're like, dude, this is true. No, we're, we're actually, this is, this is things he's done. It took us 15 to 20 minutes to convince him that we're not, screwing around with him at this point and he's even after he's kind of uh stopped you know he seemed like he believed us he messaged me privately he's like are you still fucking with me i'm like dude no i am not messing around with you he has done these things and so it was kind of really funny and it kind of sparked something in me like so like we could talk about these things i love i landon you can go on any down any rabbit hole you want to um <laughs> but i Maybe there's a lot of people that don't know you and don't know the things you have done that might would love to hear about some of the stuff you've done. And I mean, I'm, I'm going to have to agree with David. You need to write a autobiography at this point on the stuff you have done because it would make a really good book to read. Oh, well, thank you again. Uh, so this is uh, Landon Kurt Bola. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon your time zone and latitude. And, uh, and hello from your friendly secular astronomer. I'm actually glad to be on the geek room because you know I'm, I'm proud to be a geek and we can talk about geek stuff and geek out on geeky things. Yes. <laughs> um, I don't even know where to really kind of start at this point. I know I, I kind of triggered a flat earther in the chat real, uh, real quick just, just to have fun with them. Um, well, I, I, I guess if you talk about me and starting i think probably the, my my first um public interaction it was actually my first complete sentence i spoke as a child uh, <laughs> and I, I actually I, I do remember actually saying it um it was i was 22 months old we were at our we lived on a farm in uh united states california in in for people that know the bay area between hayward and pleasanton and and we're on this ridge uh, overlooking the bay. I could look from you know, San Jose all the way up to San Francisco and Marin. And I was watching. I mean, we'd watch the sunset. It was dinner time. Watching sunset over what was you know the San Mateo uh, uh, Peninsula. And I I thought it'd be neat to go and see where the sun went because because you know again I'm 22 months old. So give me a little bit of break. But in my view of cosmology at that time and what I saw was i didn't actually believe in a flat earth i believe the earth was lumpy because i could see mountains and things like that and i could see the sun going over the, the edge and so um i was really interested in seeing what that looked like right and so i i my first complete sentence i spoke was how far is the sun and of course rather than saying you know data and goo and all that sort of stuff this this, this thing came out of me um, my parents went to pick up a book. Uh, it was called Questions Children Ask. I still have that book. And they flipped to the page about how far is the sun. And they and, and, and I remember it had a picture with one of those interstate highway signs that we have in the United States. 
and you know a little exit thing that said you know had the sun shining up there and it had sun the arrow pointing and you know instead of saying this time it was we're, we were in the english units but it said 93 million miles i saw that on the sign and i knew that it that going to grandmother's house was you know an all-day affair um that it was in fact it was 550 miles and if you watch carefully the odometer at one point the thousand digit would would tick somewhere in that journey or return um so when i saw all those other digits i mean i because it because odometers i could see you know the the one the tens of the miles and miles and tens of hundreds and thousands you know going very slowly and i could i could got a really good sense of watching that thing of just how enormous that ninth three million was and so i started thinking i said gee you know this is kind of that's kind of a big number and i started thinking in my head i i I don't know how, but I knew that a mile was 5,280 feet. And I, and I knew we had a, cause, cause we had a, uh, a, a surveyor tape, a hundred foot surveyor tape we used to, to measure out fields in the farm. And so, you know, I could think, well, you know, how do you know that grandma's house up in Eugene is 515 miles? I, I could, I could envision somebody taking that hundred foot tape measure and, you know, measuring out 515 miles, not practical, but I could envision that happening. But I saw this 93 million. And I said, that's, that to me was, 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 well, that's enormous. I mean, that is really enormous, pretty far away. So my second sentence I spoke to the child was actually another very scientific one. I asked, I said, why? Um, and what, what I really, if I had the vocabulary at the time, again, I'm only 22, 20 months old, 22 months old. So give me a little bit of break. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the, the vocabulary I would have said that seems like an enormous distance. How can they measure something that far? How do they know it's that far? Um, and and my parents didn't obviously didn't know that, didn't understand my question. Uh, but it wasn't until I was nine years old. It was at uh, it was called the Morrison Planetarium in Golden. It's in it's a planetarium at, at the California um, um, Academy of Sciences in Golden Gate Park. And there was a planetarium show. The planetarium show was on the quest for the solar parallax and the transit of Venus. And it talked about Captain Cook's voyage to what is now called Point Venus Tahiti, which, by the way, I was there uh, just uh, a couple weeks ago on our expedition to Pitcairn. And we had to go through Prince Polynesia. Anyway, so they talked about this method that Newton and Halley had come up with to directly measure the distance to the sun. And the, the, the the presenter, again, this is 1969, the presenter said, you know, these transit of Venus are very rare, and unfortunately, you'll have to wait to, all the way to the year 2004 to see the next one. So as a kid, I said, okay, that's what I'm going to do, right? And so I, I waited until 2004. Um, the, the, thing, the method is that you, you have two people on Earth that, that observe the transit of Venus and, and observe how long it takes for Venus to cross the disk of the sun. And um, we had picked for weather-wise Madagascar uh, and a place in Madagascar and a place in Italy called Achetri, north of Florence. And and by the flip of the coin, I got I got, I got to pick the uh, Florence location. And there, the director of the uh, observatory, uh, uh, a renowned gentleman named Franco Pacini, who's known for um, you know hypothesizing neutron stars and pulsars. Um, he learned of our of, of my quest and said, "No, no, no! You don't want to do this here at the observatory. You want to go over to the villa, where uh, the villa across the, the canyon, and that's where Galileo had been put into prison, and for the when he was he was in prison by in position for saying things they didn't like, and <laughs> uh, there's this balcony that Galileo was allowed to come out once a week for about an hour, um, otherwise he had to stay inside, and so we." did the measurements from the balcony of, of the, the Galileo's prison. And yep, the Earth did move. And yes, we measured the distance sun. Plus the fact we had uh, letters from astronomers in 1882 and learned a lot of stuff. We know more about the trans of Venus atmosphere. And so actually pegged the, um, the distance down to a, a fairly high, uh, high precision. We're much more successful than uh, Cook and, 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 and the people at that time. Um, he had a problem. They didn't understand 
um, limb darkening. They didn't understand. They didn't take into account the um, the uh, Venus's atmosphere and other effects. So their error was 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 you know within about seven percent. But we measured it at one hundred forty nine million five hundred ninety six thousand seven hundred fifty six kilometers, plus or minus three thousand five hundred and forty three kilometers. So our error was uh, we had a point zero two three seven percent uncertainty um nailed nailed that thing um and we also done we also had done uh measurements of curvature of the earth yes the earth is curved we've measured it <laughs> we've measured distance to, to the moon and from that we could measure to, you know distance to planets and just in nearby stars um so what, and also what was, the, what was the methodology you used to measure the curvature of the earth just to trigger oh the- several <laughs> several things I and mean, one of my favorites i would do with my nephews is using the uh, difference in uh, sunset times. Um, so we had, a, for example, a lighthouse that was on the coast. And we looked at the distance, difference in time between sunset um, near, the, near the beach, so someone standing at the beach, and sunset of somebody on the, on the balcony at the top of the lighthouse. And uh, we did also things of, of, of measuring the height of the lighthouse and other sorts of things. And we used, we use the sand for our calculations. No, no calculator. And we came up with a with a, uh, a a curvature of the Earth, size of the Earth that was um, within a couple percent of, of accepted uh, norms. I think I think we're about eight percent off. But you know, given given we were eyeballing things and timing things, um, that's pretty good. There's other ways to, to handle it as well. But uh, that's one of my favorite things. Is essentially, difference in um, in sunset and the uh, in this bother. But as I say, that's I think that that notion of discovering just how large how big things are and that you could measure it and in doing the measurements were something that uh, drove drove me drove me quite a bit. And so, you know, I again I am one of those people that says, Yes, I know how far the earth is on, you know, from the earth to the sun, um, I know the distant size of things because I've measured it, right? I know how far away because I've actually now measured parallax of, of nearby stars um, um, for the moon one of the best things as well is is use the uh, Shane telescope which is a telescope at the conservatory speaking of Apollo 11 um, the uh, astronauts left on the, on the moon corner reflectors and with this three meter telescope you can scan the moon to find tranquility base and you can we have a 60 kilowatt laser 60,000 watt laser that we bounce off the mirror here at Lick towards the moon, it bounces, hits the reflector and comes back. It takes about two and a half seconds for the round trip. And so you, it, a... it's, it's relatively faint, but we use a frequency that's not, the moon is not so uh, bright at. Um, and so we see the blip coming back and we can measure now the distance to the moon within about a millimeter. Isn't there like something uh, that one of the universities does where they, they like try to bounce? like a message off the moon and like as somebody else has to decode it or something like a little yeah there's you can I mean you can use, use use the moon as, as a a radio reflector the, you don't get as quite an accurate of a, a set because you're 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 getting reflection off of a, off of a curved surface whereas the retro reflector is also the flat and small um yeah. but that's a fun thing to do as well but it's yeah. it's it's nice and you know having to do things like and you know i was because i was i was talking I think it might have been with with uh, DeGrasse Tyson about you know uh, being a flat earther's worst nightmare and and you mentioned saying yeah and I've been to the North Pole and South Pole and so forth and done all these things and it's like you know, yes I'm I'm I guess I'm their worst nightmare because I don't actually go and and assume stuff I actually measure it so and that's that's a scientific <laughs> method I mean I, it's scientific that's to great. question things yeah. like science is about questions right and so you know. Um, to have my first complete sentences be questions about my surroundings is a very scientific thing to do. And so I encourage people to question stuff. That's, that's, that's the scientific method. What I don't so, encourage people to so do that, is to wallow in ignorance. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess that maybe that means that, like, you know, me and Frankie here can engage in some science and ask you some questions and try to confirm for Billy that you're actually real. I don't I, I, I don't accept the philosophical notion that I'm just a simulation right <laughs> so, so here's here's a question you listed off a lot of places just in that little short story alone and I feel like it might be better to just say 
what what countries have you not visited yet? <laughs> that might be an easier list, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I think my, my country list is at, at 80. So, for example, I have not been to Sri Lanka. I have not been to Afghanistan. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure I've not been to Afghanistan. Um, when people like the Indian subcontinent ask me if I've ever been to India or Pakistan, depending on who's asking me, I, I have to say sort of like maybe because um, with the Chinese, I went to Kashmir and um, Kashmir, China. And actually, yes, it's, it's actually Kashmir is disputed between China and India and Pakistan. Um, so depending on whose map it is, I was in um, all three, but. Okay. <laughs> so have you yeah, been, there's, there's, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say you've been pretty much uh, a lot of places. So you've been like traveling all around the globe, right? Yeah, all, all the continents, all of the, even the alleged one, red eye, um, <laughs> <laughs> all, all of the oceans and pretty much all the, all the seas, although it, it turns out that there's different definitions of what a sea is, right? But, but yeah, it's, it's, but exactly. you know, it's, it's, it's just I, part, my, of, my part of being an astronomer and having to go alphabet. places is while you're there, you might as well check things out, right? So that's, that's a fun thing. So have you visited the third letter of the alphabet, Landon? Have you vetted, vetted, visited the third letter of the alphabet? Well, that's C, my definition for C. As a language, um, <laughs> I was an early, I mean, my first exposure to C was in 1974. Um, so one of the things my, my dad, by I was a farmer, was also employed by the Pacific Telephone Company, which was a division of AT&T. My, my uncle worked at Bell Labs. And we had a, at our, our farm a, a teletype thing that was connected to the bell system. So unlike people who are doing phone freaking, you know, trying to do this, we actually had a control, uh, a control station in our in our in our in our house, and you're expected to use that because you get make place free calls and free connections as opposed to dialing, um, which was expensive. And so we got to, I got to there's a particular uh, spot where my uncle encouraged me to go out to the machine at Mary Hill where the where the people developing. Uh, Unix, you know, Richie, Kurtigan, and people like that were were running. It was the fifth fifth version of Unix at the time, um, and uh, Dennis Ritchie's slash user slash DMR slash C was his was the C compiler, right? I mean, it was in his his uh, home directory and got to use early versions of C with a ad editor and so forth. So yes, I've had I've had uh, long connections to the third letter for a long time. Um, you do uh you were involved in the the obfuscated C contest thing, weren't you? Yes, I mean I, I founded it, so you might see <laughs> I've been yeah. involved. And uh I was a co and was I've this, been was you know, this judging they added the pluses. Oh I mean yes well we, the cause, cause the C contest international uh, the IOCCC, International Obfuscated C Code Contest, go to IOCCC.org. Um, you'll see what that's about, but uh, this this is a straight C, and it's uh, the base thing is is um, write a complete C program, um, and uh, it's um, the the size limit. We're limited to essentially about four thousand ninety six characters. Although if you exclude white space and stuff, you have about two thousand um, two thousand five hundred uh, characters of, of of like non white space stuff. But you're limited essentially about 4K, and you got to write a complete program in 4K that does something interesting and does it in an obfuscated manner. So it's got to work, and and it's got to be crazy. And and people, I am just astounded by the creativity of of what is um, what people have done in in just 4,000 bytes of stores. Right? I mean, one of my favorite was, ones was a complete yeah. flight simulator, flight simulator in 4,096 bytes of, of source. Damn, um, that's, you know, that's chess programs, compilers, uh, a a emulator of an eighty eighty six, uh, you know, a, a, a machine. I mean, just just amazing stuff that people have done, and and the code is just bizarre beyond belief. So, yeah, I had a few things. With... <laughs> I've heard my geek, geek cred. I mean, I can, I guess other Greek geek cred I can claim is that, for example, um, the weight pit system call was in in Unix. Is me. Um, I'm one of the. I'm not one of the, f I, 
I wasn't one of the primary authors of the BSD, but it's one of the contributors, you know, in the list of, of, of also thank you, blah, 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 is, is me there. So BSD stuff. So Unix and um, Unix was a very important early influence in my computer. Although that wasn't my first computer. My first computers were um, IBM uh, mainframes, um, IBM 360 mainframes. About 64, my dad would take me to the machine room at uh, on um, the AT&T Bell Telephone Center in San Francisco, New Montgomery. And there they had an IBM 6, 360 30. And uh, I like I pretty like the, the key punch with the with the punch cards because you could you know you press things that make noise and you make holes in cards, um, and uh, I also like to to do the mounting of the tapes. So I had a you know step ladder. I could put the put the mag tapes up on the the thing when my dad needed me to mount tapes because they had the tapes had numbers on the side and I like numbers. So that was that was sort of my early computer stuff. But uh, my first real computer heavy computer usage was the Bell Labs machines and Unix, and that's sort of kept with me ever since so like you grew up in sort of rural america as you know on, on a farm and everything so i mean chance is pretty good that that there was some religion going on there but yeah 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 we were we were um we were pretty hardcore american baptists um and and that time it was explained to me the american baptists differed from the southern baptists in that American Baptists didn't like smoking, right? Smoking was a sin, um, but the Southern Baptists could tolerate smoking. Is what they were told. Um, but you know, it was it was kind of funny because the Baptists were pride themselves. Their creed was they don't have a creed, even though they had lots of creeds. So, but you know, that's that's religion. So yeah, I was I was a uh, I would call myself a a a a Sunday fundy, right? A fundamentalist, mm -hmm. particularly <laughs> on Sunday. Um, what broke that? What? What like for you like, were you, you know? I mean, you were discovering large prime numbers and stuff by the time you were eighteen. So I'm, I'm like, it's like abandoning religion at like age five. You're like, all oh, this is bullshit. Like, no, you know, I'm actually, like, I, actually, it was, it was abandoning religion much, much later in life. Um, uh, but, but I, I guess I refused to commit intellectual suicide. Um, is what I saw. Again, this is personal. I mean, I, 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 so if you're listening to to me and you're religious, you know, okay. Uh, fine um i'll judge you not based upon your religion but based upon how you treat others mm. um i think for me the not one committing on suicide was 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 one out um so i was very very good at apologetics um and by apologetics by apologetics that's really a a nice nice word for coming up with excuses to rationalize batshit crazy stuff right um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, and, and, it, and it's it's interesting because you know I had I I knew the Bible very well and I'd read it uh, as a kid three times as on my fourth fourth sort of cycle I'm not sure why I stopped at the my fourth cycle but it it's there's a there's a there's a show put on by, by the Milwaukee atheist called you know Atheist Sunday School that's put on at um, eleven. Um, on Sunday, 11 Pacific, um, uh, 13 or 1 p.m. Central. And they just read the Bible. And it's interesting listening to and reading the Bible again as an adult saying, you know, WTF, how, how did I apply any level of credibility to that book? Because um, yeah. you just read it, right? That's the worst thing I think that, that someone could do um, you know, uh, that, that you could do religious wise is read the book. So when we read the Bible, it was done in the context of a social envelope and a intellectual dishonesty envelope. Um, I mean, it's, it's one of the reasons why you know, this, this, this guy named Sai Tin, who has committed thorough com intellectual suicide, I really feel sorry for the man. Um, I know that people like Steve like him, but I think he is his ideas are dangerous and his ideas are are deadly to people's minds um i know that because you know like the like the ex-smoker is very intolerant of people that smoke um the ex-religious people is not very kind towards people who should know better but but refuse to do so so this apologetic stuff just it just got to the point where it just got to be too silly too much um 
still, you know, the 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 social process that's centered around um, uh, where if your social life and your um, connections are through the church and through religion, it's a very powerful hook to keep you there. It's a very difficult to decide you're going to abandon your social life and um, and and become you know one of them, one of the unbelievers or disbelievers or so forth. So, like one of the things that that interests me when people leave religion, particularly like people who leave because they've tried to think things through, right? Like they're they're legitimately trying to like find some truth. It's not just because they're you know they just decided oh this is silly and then. I'm an atheist now. Like a, a lot of people go through more of like a transition where they try to explore other concepts, try to like sort of fill that gap. Was there any of that for you when you when the hook of sort of like Christianity was gone? What did you try to fill it with before? Oh, I mean, I I I, 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 should say, I even had a pretend. Oh well, I'm gonna tear down my religion and and rebuild things, but that was a tear down my theology and rebuild my theology that was not an honest um examination of the whole of the whole question um but i guess now if someone said you know what about god i would reply as the probably apocryphal story is of laplace um pierre laplace an amazing individual whose whose contributions to the world are are extraordinarily profound i mean i i put him up on the same pantheon as people like newton in fact he went and fixed a lot of Newton's Principia that people are so enamored with. He actually fixed a number of things, filled in gaps and, and, and refined Newton's method um, um, pretty well. But anyway, Laplace, there's rumored at one point he had an audience with, with Napoleon. We know that he, he and Napoleon Bonaparte interacted. And at the, the legend goes that Napoleon sort of, in hearing about Laplace and all this stuff, asked you know well where is god in all this i mean you haven't mentioned god and laplace's response was i have no need for that hypothesis meaning laplace said i don't need a god to explain things like motions of the planets or or uh you know acceleration down a ramp or other sorts of of, of general physics things um and i think that's where i'm, I'm at is that i have no need so I would say that, and this is a this is a nod to Steve McRae, that I'm uh, I'm an agnostic as Steve Gray defines it. There you go. <laughs> nice. There's gonna there's gonna be like ninety five percent of people that are triggered by that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And of the other five percent, yeah, I, I I'm I'm a colloquial atheist, but if you talk about the definitions of logic. As Steve defines it, I'm not agnostic. <laughs> He's like, wait a minute, someone's talking about me. His agnostic sense is tingling right now. So, yeah. I like to say, every anytime you say anything with agnostic or atheism, it's just somehow Steve just pops right in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's he's a good soul, so you yeah. should you should uh, on there. And I, I say that I say that ironically. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So like you should ask, you ask Steve whether or not he has a soul. <laughs> what do you think? Um, what do you think is is something that you've contributed to over the years that has had the most impact on the most people, like the that like the ev everyday average person is impacted by that they have no idea you were involved with. I think I think some of the stuff in 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 Unix and in some of the early internet, early internet and early operating systems. Is something I had had a contribution towards, um, and some of the earliest definitions or standardizations around how does how does Unix work? POSIX P one thousand three, um, and then dot two standard dot three. The shell, for example, the the, the Bash shell uh, that people often use, or, or Z shell, um, came about. Uh, it was a work with I worked with David Korn, who was the author of the Korn shell, to try and replace the Born shell, which is this sort of brain damaged um, piece of code that Benefit used to be by the man named, man named Steve Born. Um, and we wanted to get a shell that was actually much more functional. And so the POSIX standard for how, how command line shells work and extended it 
was largely to put in modern techniques rather than try to define this really poor thing. And that International Obfuscated Secret Contest, one of the inspirations, one of my inspirations for founding that was reading Steve Bourne's source of the Bourne Shell. It's a truly, it's, it's truly wretched. And, and the fact that what amazed me was it's not just bad code, but he put a lot of effort into making it bad code. Um, and it was stagnant for quite a while because the difficulty of trying to change it and improve it was, was quite, quite difficult. So people like uh, David Core and other folks started writing shells and the bash shell came about and Z shell came about from the standardization. So a lot of command line stuff is, is, um, and my influence on it, but there's other things too. I mean, um, flipping over, uh, I had the privilege of, because of through my parents and their connections of, of being introduced to a number of cause and number of, of people there. One of the things is the African National Congress. Um, I was a very early supporter, um, at least for me, of the a a ANC. And uh, it came about because of one of my, um, one of my college uh, friends um, was a gentleman from South Africa, went back and was accused of being a member of a band organization, the ANC, and was eventually in prison on Robben Island off the coast of in Cape Town. And he was actually in prison with Mandela at the time. Um, we helped his family and some other families um, be able to survive in that era of apartheid, um, contributing through uh, through through channels um, and and uh, making sure that their families. Because when when someone like the husband of the family is, you know, declared to be a, a, a a bad person in the eyes of apartheid. Um, the family is now a suspect as well. And it's very difficult for them to survive um, other than doing things like this, like this, this, my friends, um, well, I mean, her, 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 probably her only other thing would have been to be a, you know, a prostitution or, an, or, or effectively domestic servitude. Um, and so the fact that we kept them, kept them at least fed and and somewhat comfortable was a great comfort to people at the at the uh, at the prison and so when i got to meet uh, mandela um to my surprise he knew who i was and in fact there's this we we, we met in person in oakland when he did a sort of his freedom tour in 1990 and um there's a sort of a vip room i got to go in and i was sort of like this 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 fly on the corner um and I remember this, this thing where, where um, uh, when Nelson Mandela would come into a room, um, it's one of those people that all of a sudden you knew something was different. Right? He had this, this enormous presence that was just uh, quite astounding. And so when Mandela just stepped in the room of this, of this group of people, you knew there was Mandela. And I remember um, Jesse Jackson deciding he was the, the top dog and puffing himself up to go and shake his hand and mandela walked right past him right past a couple other dignitaries i won't mention because I, I i don't mean any disrespect to them made a beeline to me shook out his hand and said landon i want to thank you very much for what you did no really <laughs> oh, and, yeah. and i'm going wow. to, oh okay sir uh <laughs> and said no it's just you understand we were very aware of what you and your were doing for our families and that was an enormous comfort to us in the darkest hour we profoundly appreciate what you did wow that's kind of that's, that's pretty cool <laughs> so that's well i, I mean not cool for jesse uh you know jesse jackson he, <laughs> and you know. Like, and I look back at jackson looking like who is this dude right to just you know, <laughs> i didn't mean to do that but but um jesse jackson's like fuck this guy <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, 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 it had a thing. And so, um, you know, it, 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 when, when things got stable in South Africa, I got to go, go there. Um, and, and we, we were guests, we went to Soweto, right. And not staying in Pretoria or in big hotel in Johannesburg. We went and lived in Soweto, um, the Southwestern township was the spot where people sort of congregated because the people of Johannesburg at that time. The, the, the power structure didn't want to look at those people 
it was it was a spot where the where the cyanide tailings of the mines hid essentially that that area and and it's known kind of notorious for being a slum but also it, it had fairly wealthy people as well it's just that those are people that were on in the eyes of the apartheid era they were called black there were blacks colors and whites um and so this is where the blacks were were kept when when mostly the women because the men were were taken to work the mines and so their kind of families were separated and so it was a it was a matrical run run system but there were some of those guys that's where i got to meet uh desmond tutu a really fun guy um really funny dude i he was he's just a delight you know again there on, on the streets and so forth and um people were quite you know appreciative there it was it was an amazing experience to live for you know uh only it's only i had to live i mean i spent you know several days there at Soweto, but it was a really big deep impression and that's where i was invited um to sit um on what's called the truth and reconciliation committee this is a this is a committee that was set up by mandela to uh to look at essentially the the look deeply in the past of what happened and to try to bring to light what happened and and, and it had the power to grant full pardon to people who came before the commission and confessed you know that's what they did political crimes you know or politically motivated crimes I think the, the U.S. needs a truth and reconciliation committee in like, Trump's <laughs> yeah. cabinet right now, right? Yeah. And that, that's what, that was one of the most extraordinary events um, I've ever seen. Um, you saw these people who came in and they were just destroyed knowing what they've done. And, and the, the, the rule was you had, to, you had to tell all. You had to, to, to bring evidence. You had to be, answer any question. You couldn't hold anything back. You had to receive a pardon. And, and I, to this day, I still remember, um, cause you, you would see the families of victims or victims forgiving and hugging these people who had done horrific acts. You know, I, I, I remember this one guy and, and he was just a, a wreck of a human and, and, and he was being forgiven by a mother. And he said, you, you know, he said, but you, ma'am, you don't understand. I, I poked your child's eyes out Oh wow! before I strangled her. And she said, yes, and I forgive you. And he would just, he tried to, you know, he was trying to explain I'm that person. And she would just hug him and say, no, I forgive you. Um, there wasn't dry eyes in that house. I still remember this today. And and to see the 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 people of South Africa and what they because they there were people there who had a real a real strong urge to to pour out hate and and we, many of us thought that the downfall of apartheid would be a a, a bloodbath a, a terrible uh, situation and to see this thing happen where you know but but they got to know things like what happened to Stephen Biko what happened to the Sharpeville Massacre, some of these things that, that they know because people came forward, confessed and received full pardon, but also forgiveness of the victims or the families of the victims. It was an amazing thing. This was you know, chaired by, by uh, again, uh, Archbishop Desmond, Desmond Tutu, an amazing event to, to experience. Very, very difficult to sit through. Um, I only sat through a, a, you know, a couple of sessions, but um, it was something that was there. I, the only other time I had a, a interaction with Mandela, um, I met him in, or the time I met him in Pretoria, in a, in an area that was sort of known as sort of the Afrikaners Square. It used to be, it would essentially be sort of like the, the what it, we would call it the home of the KKK. It was a home of the sort of Afrikaner white power area. But, but obviously now in a post thing when he was president, a uh, very different situation. And you know, sitting there looking at this place and knowing that, yeah, that just a short time ago, um, no black or colored person would be allowed to even reign near this stuff. And and here now, Mandela's president, he shows up in his limo. He was on a hurry, but he essentially came in and said, "I want you to meet this gentleman." And says, "Judge," and I said, "This is the judge that sent me to prison, and I'd like you to have lunch with him." Oh. Right? And and I learned to say that 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 this judge again the guy that's put Mandela in a prison for twenty seven years I think was 
maybe it was Cacto, somewhere like that, long, long time. Um, Mandela insisted that he remain a judge because he said he was a fair judge. He applied the law on the books at the time. Nothing should happen. In fact, he was one of the people that held the Constitution that Mandela swore the oath on to become president. And he was still a pressing judge of the day there and 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 think again about somebody who had an grave injustice was put into prison and he had that much personal integrity to honor the the still honor the people and humanity of those people that are there it was pretty pretty amazing so anyway that's a that's the thing of was early supporter of the anc before it became fashionable and 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 but there's other stuff too I've I've done. But if you want to know about things that had a profound influence, that was certainly one of them. And that's one of the stories we actually tried to, not really. We we, just, we said you actually got to meet Nelson, uh, Nelson Mandela, and uh, that's one of the things that Billy didn't believe us about. So um, I hope he's still listening. He <laughs> no, wasn't was... he was in the um, chat, so I hope he's still listening. Um, I think yeah, he's it, a little jealous today. <laughs> so. it, it, it really is. It, it, and Mandela was really an extraordinary human being. He had his flaws. And I'm not saying that he's, he's you know, in any of these type things. But he was an extraordinary human being that had an extraordinary profound impact all around the world. Um, you know, I, having it, it, I was in, in the Libyan desert uh, because of an eclipse. And uh, I was a guest of the Tuareg, which were the, the desert people, the nomadic people, and the and the and the big, you know, chief area guy, you know, learned that I had, you know, I had shook Mandela's hand, and he came basically to seek me out to hug me, saying, "I want to hug a person who had shaken, you know, Mandela's hand." Um, you know, they they Mandela is known well around around the world. Um, and his contributions, I mean, are are extraordinary, and it's. I just feel privileged to have it, you know, met him for a couple of times. I mean, there's it's it seems like there's probably a lot of people that you've met that probably feel. I mean, I know that uh, uh, Mr. Feynman, Feynman uh, was someone, yeah, <laughs> uh, that's a little... that's, that probably falls into that category. I would think as well. Yeah, it, that's the thing. Um, I guess as a kid, when it when I big when I met people like that, um, I I didn't I never really sort of, of suffered this sort of stardom star truck star truck sort of thing um you know it was it was through like my 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 connections with 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 uh dr lamer at berkeley that i met people like selfridge and erdish and so forth and that's also where i'm um got connected with Feynman. and i didn't realize at the time but Feynman, one of his things if you know about the Feynman method of learning stuff was explain if if you could explain it in simple terms to somebody without using you know complex you know uh, uh, terms of art if you could explain it simply and coherently you understood it and and so he would he would actually enjoy sitting down and talking with somebody and explaining some of these things to people in in very simple terms and i remember so so my interaction either when when Feynman was coming up to lawrence um, berkeley laboratories or a couple times it was down at Caltech, his, you know, um, a couple times where he basically said, okay, you know, I'm going to explain to you special relativity and general relativity. And he explained it in such simple terms, like, you know, and it seemed to be, in fact, when he, when he would explain it, it was like pretty obvious, right? And, and to me, you know, relativity was, was something that, that was, and still is today, it's, to me, is relatively straightforward, pun intended. Um, and so his thing was, you know, here's special relativity and talk you know, the Lynch contraction and, 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 you know, speed of light being in, in all, all, you know, is the same in all, all, all frames and what you had to do, what, how the universe behaved because of that, that, that fact. And then general relativity talking about um, gravity and acceleration equivalent stuff um, of, of looking at, you know, again, I'm talking about general relativity and special relativity. It seems straightforward. And, and this is now to today to my embarrassment. Then he started talking about quantum mechanics, <laughs> and 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 probably some of it might have been a bit of my religious background, but I I do remember with frown, with frown, profound regret saying to Feynman when he started talking about quantum mechanics of things like 
well, now you're just being silly. I mean, there's no way the universe works like that. And then, and he he was very patient. And I was, what do you mean? Quantum kind of blah, blah, blah. So I had a, I, I, a, a, my embarrassment is like, here's a kid who rejected quantum mechanics from Feynman. <laughs> had the audacity to say, no, that can't seem to be right. And, and in fact, um, in college, um, I spent a lot of time testing quantum mechanics. Now, I had come to terms with it as sort of as being a, a highly evaluated, you know, um, highly tested theory. But I was determined to see, well, maybe there's a, maybe there are quarter cases, maybe there's stuff that isn't quite right. And so I would, uh, in college, design experiments to see if I can catch quantum mechanics in the act and, and see a violation of, of the model. I failed, of course, but but that again is an example where it's it's a scientific skepticism saying is this is this model a good model of reality? So I would design test and, and push it. I think Feynman, if he'd been alive at that time, would have would have approved saying yes, you know, test it, check it, question it, and then accept you know, but then look at the re look honestly at the results and so. You know, I, I challenge quantum mechanics, so that's. Uh, were you ever? Uh, were you at all involved in the the sort of little back and forth between um, Hawking's and uh, Susskind? Well, I did. In fact, I um, my conversation, you know, Hawking's about that. This is that this, this is the um, one of the things is you know his 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 famous encyclopedia bet, and whether or not information is destroyed um, in, a, in a black hole. Mm -hmm. And quantum mechanics says no. Um, and it, it is interesting that, you know, uh, Hawking conceded the bet. But in my conversation with Hawking, he said, yeah, you know, it's true that my conceding was not based upon facts, but pays, based upon a change of opinion. And I was saying, you know, it, and I, so we, we talked about, well, talk is in, you know, texting, right? He would text and I text or he would. Uh, he didn't always use his voice thing it was sort of, you know, text chatting of stuff. Um, the question I had was, you know, I, I don't think if I were you, I would have conceded the bet. I would have left it open. And I said, well, but you know, all I said, so, but I would left it open and I would have bequeathed the, 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 the cycle instead of encyclopedias to the person who did the who per, did the best at at resolving the paradox of does does is information destroyed um, in a black hole and and I think I it, Hawking may have been may we may find that Hawking was right um, the fact that Hawking conceded the bet and thought he was wrong was just Hawking's opinion he re, you know he said yeah you know it probably would have been better if I had said this is unresolved and I will, you know, the, the, the people in the bet would have bequeathed this set of encyclopedias to the person who does the best to, to resolve this question. Did, uh, did you ever talk to, to Leonard Suss about his, his position on this? Like, did, did yeah, um, as well. And it's sort of, it's because this is sort of, this is a, I mean, it is a profound thing on, on terms of what, what happens there it was, it was this this business about um, singularities. There's a if you hear people talk about black holes, um, you'll hear often someone talk about well, what's beyond the event horizon in, in inside the, the beyond the, the the point of no return, and they describe it as well. There's 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 a singularity. There's a mathematical point where stuff can be crushed to infinite density, and and I. I, I took a very suspect view that that you could have an infinite density that that the material inside a black hole could be crushed to a mathematical point. You know, mathematics says that's the case, but but one of the things that was taught to me very strongly was the universe doesn't ask my permission to do what it does. So I can theorize all I want. I can say I like you know blah blah blah, and I like general theory, you know, general relativity and special relativity, and I like this and that. Um, and the standard model looks, looks, looks is a nice mathematical framework, but that doesn't mean daily squat. The universe is going to do what it does. 
as a scientist, we ask questions of, of what's going on and try to come up with models to predict what the universe does. But our models aren't the universe. So, so the the notion that material inside a black hole could be crushed to a mathematical point, um, the math allows that, but but that not may not be reality. Um, and I'm happy to say now that that skepticism version, like, what do you mean you don't believe in singularities? So no, I say no, no. It's not that I don't believe in singularities. I don't see the evidence that 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 the mathematics has any analog in 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 reality um and in fact i think now there's more and more people that say well it's probably the case that you've got a denser form of of matter inside a black hole but it's probably not a point size object it's probably some other weird collapsible state it'd be fun to find out why or what why it isn't a singularity and what keeps it in a non-zero size point um unfortunately anyway, actually, you couldn't publish <laughs> you couldn't yeah, get it yeah, peer-reviewed <laughs> i was gonna say like that sounds like something that's like almost unknowable well one of the things that's this happening there's there's an there's an effort to build a next generation of accelerators um and one of the things that we hope out of this next generation of accelerators is to be able to pr- produce energy densities that can create um micro or you know, subatomic sized black holes and those black holes will decay almost instantaneously with Hawking radiation. Um, but that will give us a lot of information about black holes. Um, no, no, it won't swallow the Earth. That's really, that's not how it works. In fact, the, the, the black holes, if they're formed in an accelerator, are going to decay so fast that even it's, it's unlikely that light will even be able to get into a black hole. Um, they'll decay before even the light has a, has a ability to travel across the diameter of the thing. Um, so what we'll observe is the the Hawking radiation decay of the black hole, which which it's a shame because had had we been able to do that in accelerated wall five, then you'd have experimental confirmation of Hawking radiation, assuming that's what we observe, and therefore Hawking could have gotten a prize uh, for that. I'm almost certain, but he's dead, and Nobel Prize rules say you can't you can't give it to dead people. You can't give it to somebody who has a nice theory. So, for example, um, Einstein, general, when he had published his special relativity and general relativity, one profound theory that profoundly changed our our view of nature, um, he would not have been eligible for those those theories. However, um, uh, it was Eddington and his group that confirmed. Um, uh, rel- special relativity, gen- you know, relativity in general with the, with the uh, photograph the, of the eclipse, it would have been quite proper to give it to Eddington and, and Einstein. Um, but the rules have, the, the, the committee has wacky rules to say, you know, they, they were, they were one, not really interested in giving someone more than one physics prize. They sort of say, well, Einstein already got it for, for the, the, um, the photoelectric effect, ironically, a quantum mechanical thing. Um, so they were kind of reluctant to give it to him again. Um, but then there's very few people that could actually pull off more than one Nobel Prize in the same field. So sometimes they'll they'll contrive it like like with with when Pauling got his first Nobel Prize, they actually gave it to him in chemistry. And uh, as you know, Pauling said, he's he was he was a fastest conversion from a physicist to a chemist. Uh, you know, in, in the history of the world. They say, won a Nobel Prize, but we want to give it to you in chemistry. Like, okay, I'll become a chemist. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so that was one of the things, that, that's one of those weird, the prize. Um, and, and and actually, it, 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 it was ironic, this this thing. We had a, um, I talked with his grandson on our expedition to Pitcairn, was on our on our ship. And I mentioned that the, the Nobel Peace Prize, which is that thing, not in Sweden, but over in Norway they do, is kind of a, I think it's kind of a dodgy sort of thing. It's, by dodgy, what I mean, it doesn't really fit with the rest of the Nobel Prizes. Um, and they sometimes give it to to the weirdest people. It seems to be more of a political prize 
than a than a, mm. than a prize of achievement. And so we had a comment, you know, and I recommend telling him I said, you know, I you know, Pauling's got a, got the Peace Prize for working hard at um, um, stopping, you know, above ground nuclear testing. Um, and right. in the face of he did this in the face of of significant attacks on him by things like you know the the, the wacky you know Republican senators who are on the anti communism stuff and the House Un American Communities Commission. He he had gotten twenty two thousand scientists to sign a petition asking that above ground nuclear testing stop there'd be a ban on or a complete test ban as well. And that was seen as, as, as un-American. And they, the, the, the signature were known, but they wanted Pauling to tell them who helped him gather all those signatures and Pauling refused. So Pauling's Nobel chemistry prize gave him a status that, that he could withstand the, the vitriolic attack that was done um, in the name of patriotism. Uh, so in some ways, yeah, he kind of deserves, you know, he deserves recognition for the, the, his work he did on, 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 on ban on nuclear testing, nuclear weapons testing, I should say. Um, but still the, the, the peace prize has got, they do weird stuff. I mean, they give it to people like Kissinger for, for not killing as many people in Southeast Asia. They oh, give it goodness. to a president because of what he might do in his, term as president that it's it's right it's but but many of the other people that that the the prices they go to sweden are, are pretty genuine so i know that we've got probably some other questions going to come up and whatnot sure. but i don't want frankie to forget that he wanted to uh to give a little shout out to one of your other good friends that streams on the internet Yes, thank you for reminding me of that. Um, if you'll check down into the in the description below, uh, you'll see a uh, thing for Pitmump. He is raising money for one to kind of have a hernia surgery because he's got a he's got a pretty bad hernia, so he's been dealt with it long enough. He needs to help get it, you know, to get it uh, worked on and stuff like that. But also, he is actually working on something that I think is really kind of cool, and he's wanting to work on a documentary. He wants to go to each states in america and maybe australia if he can and do a uh, comedy uh, routine um i know he's talked about coming down here where i'm at and i teach him how to you know throw asses and we go up to a comedy club and, and stuff like that so i think that's gonna be a really cool uh cause if you want to uh donate um it's just right down below it's actually a little uh paypal pool center so guys, if you can yeah. definitely uh, help that out, because Landon's been on his ch uh, on Pitmunch channel a bunch of times. I've been on Pitmunch channel a bunch of times. Um, it, it'd be a really good thing to uh, if you got a few shekels, you know, if you want to give out to him, that'd be a great thing to do. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's the, the the his hernia operation is something that is getting to the point of being you know life life limiting, right? He's, yeah, it's it's, it's it's getting worse. Um, it also, you know, it, it, it has a profound health effect on him. He has done a lot to um, get his health under control. Yeah, he has lost, he's lost weight. Yeah, he's lost almost 100 pounds. He has quit smoking. He is really focusing on, on health. And, and this hernia operation is something that's quite important. The other thing, of course, is the documentary of who Pemmung is and, and his family and background. Um, is going to also be something that will be very valuable to, to us because there's a, there's a number of lessons that, that we could learn from, from Pitmung and, and who he is, his, his story, and his, his improv. So I, I would really ask you, after you subscribe to the Geek Room, to go and, and, and give a contribution, even if it's a small contribution. That'll help. Yeah, even if it's a dollar, yeah. uh, five dollars, or whatever. I mean, definitely try because this, what he's planning on doing is going to be really cool, and I want to help. Yeah, you know, and, and get him, and he'll be able to get the, he'll be able to meet with the fans. Yeah, um, a lot of stuff and, and and see this place there. So so if you can help, yeah. So I think back to see in terms of 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 geekdom, you know. I, it's stuff that I've had 
I've had either fortunate of, of being around meeting people or being in the right place at the right time. So speaking but of I, right place at the right time, you were at, at maybe wrong time, depending on how you want to look at it. You were at Mount St. Helens. Oh, yeah. Um, our volcanoes is something I really enjoy. So <laughs> as, I mean, as so, so if, if it's say the type of astronomer that I am is a planetary scientist, I study I study planets and 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 planetary scientists start at the core of a planet. Well, through the the thing to the surface, so that's and the Earth, we call it geology, and then you deal with the atmosphere, that's meteorology, and then you have outer space, which is classical astronomy. Um, and so, one of the geologic processes that's actually easy to see that's one of the more dramatics um, is is volcanoes, earthquakes also, but but volcanoes have this particular spectacular thing, and and I. I was very early on as a kid uh, introduced to Mount Lassen, Lassen Volcanic National Park in California. Um, so I think that's where I began to familiarize myself with okay, so and, and in the 60s, you know, Mount Lassen erupted in 1915. So it still was reasonably fresh. The, the eruption, I could see what had happened with the Great Blast. And so it was to my utter delight that, that Mount St. Helens started actually erupting in 19. 7919 um in 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 near the college Linfa college it was the time and again in 1980 the great the great um the great blast that occurred on the morning of may 18th um we had positioned ourselves behind a ridge near mount st helens but we were to the we were to the southwest the jet stream was going from the southwest to the northeast and part of that was because we had a strong jet stream to, if there was ash fallout, we didn't want it coming dusting over us. We were there to um, collect early samples of coming out of the, of the eruption because um, we had a really good idea that the, the mountain was going to fail. We didn't, we, we had, we were predicting something that was sort of Mount Lassen style of Mount Lassen's great hot blast that occurred um, where the, the mountain went quiet, pressure built up, and went bang. That was, we were seeing the same sort of thing. And in fact, that would happen in Mount St. Helens. The, the thing we hadn't expected was that the explosion um, that was to the side um, undercut the plug, central plug to such a degree that it fell down into the magma chamber and splashed out the magma chamber, which, which hit Spirit Lake and went, went across on a, on a, on a you know, subsonic speeds across the lake on a, on a, and, and, cause a devastation area but we were so we were there but but um and we knew where the weak spot was we knew where the hot spot was there was a there was a place um below what was called goat rocks ghost rock um mount st helens many of the pictures you see it's this sort of perfect sort of bell you know a uh, uh, bell curve type of thing it was a very beautiful mountain at the time very sort of symmetric it was known but there was a little bit of imperfection on the side on the northeast side and it was called goat rocks and below ghost rocks that was where the plug had sort of like a little side vent and had a little bit of out rock off rock. below that plug um it was um that area was moving out at a rate of about let's see two meters off oh, a little over six feet an hour the bulge with the, the, the ground was bulging out um it uh, the mountain had not had a steam eruption in, in a long time, but but the epicenters were getting higher and higher up inside the mountain. Right? It was actually epicenters earthquakes inside the mountain, and it was bulging to that side, um, which is the same sort of thing happened with Mount uh, Mount Lassen. Again, it's anesthetic explosions. Um, now, other and, than other than um, just measuring the the lava flow and whatnot, were there other techniques or, or measurements or things that you were developing or studying while you were there? Well, the, the, one of the things was to collect samples to then rush them down to Reed College had a nuclear reactor and they had a facility in, in, a, in, a, in a, basically in a, in a water, water, a water pool, swimming pool reactor. And you could put samples down into the reactor. Um, the purpose of that was so that new, the irradiated was neutrons. And, and then you could analyze the gamma radiation coming off of your samples in order to put elements there. Not only what elements what isotopes are coming out of Mount St. Helens. So it's a way of, of, of analyzing the chemical composition, the isotope composition of a volcano. Um, 
you know, a lot of, you know, Mount St. Helens, there's a lot of, of, of water and carbon dioxide comes out as well, but uh, it, it's a lot of the gases come out, but also other, other compounds. And so we were wanting to see what was coming out of the volcano um, on, a, on a fresh eruption of that scale. Now, wasn't that there, was, yeah. Wasn't there, wasn't there something being done where they, they were measuring like the contractions using reactors? Well, well, yes. I mean, at the time, you know, this was pre GPS day. So we had, uh, there was a, there's a firm called Evergreen Helicopters that, that operated out of the Minville, Oregon. And the hop, our, our operator pilots would, would take us up and we had those, um, pyramid like reflection reflectors that you sometimes see when a truck is off the side of the road and wants to sort of uh, put those little corner things saying, Hey, don't run into me. So they put those corner, those pyramid corner reflectors out. Um, those were things that we sprinkle around the mountain and we use lasers to bounce off of those corner reflectors, much like the earth moon stuff is done in order to measure the, the distance. Um, and that's where we knew about the expansion on the side, uh, that, that Mount St. Helens was bulging on the side and was going to have a, you know, eruption was going to come out of that, at that spot. Um, so that was, that was part of the, the, the deforming thing. But the thing I think that, 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 you know, and of course, subsequently I've, I've had the pleasure of being, um, up close and personal with Madame Paley at, at the Kilo volcano in Hawaii. The thing that people, if you've never been at an eruption is you see a lot of pictures, you know, the lava and so most of the time, um, you don't see big red stuff coming out. Most of the time it's, it's. The stuff when it hits the air instantly cools and solidifies and you sort of have silvery stuff, foamy stuff coming out. The thing that you miss um, is the sound. The, the, the sounds that volcanoes make are extraordinary. And, and, and I can't, you, you can't, there's no concert system. There's no uh, high, you know, home stereo thing that can, that can convey what a volcano does. I mean, in case of Mount St. Helens, we had a mountain-sized subwoofer that was putting out enormous sound volumes. And we had a we had sound um, analyzers, subsonic sound analyzers. And I remember uh, Mount St. Helens, it was there was a there was a peak at seven hertz and a peak at three hertz, right? Of this this infrasound. And and you could feel it in your chest, you could hear it, it's just too low for hearing, but you could feel it inside you of this, these, these sound waves um, from this mountain throbbing away. And, and um, we saw you know, similar things in, 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 in like Kilauea at 13 hertz and 70 hertz, these subsonic sounds. But, but there are, whenever you have a primary, like a musical instrument that has a primary tone, you have overtones. So you do hear the overtones that are the instrument, in this case, a mountain, makes as it as it's as it's, it's rumbling away and so you can hear the low the again, harmonics but but the low frequency rumble that's there um you also could feel it in the ground and um, that is just extraordinary it's 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 hard to describe this extremely loud subsonic um thing that that happens as 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 magma is becoming lava and and as exploding out um, it's, it's, and, and I guess to say, you just got to be there and, and you can't, there's, there's no stereo systems going to be able to convey something like that at, at those, at those volumes. So it's, it's, yeah, it's just, I guess one of the things they just have to be there. I mean, it's, it's funny because most people, if you're talking about volcanoes and earthquakes and unhospitable terrains, the last thing that they'd be saying is, oh, you have to be there. <laughs> right, they want to be as they want to be as far the fuck away from a volcano going off as possible. Yeah. And well, oh no, you need... you, you've got to go and experience the rumble in your chest at the volcano. And, like, <laughs> no, well, you got to you got to if, if it, no, um, I guess to say that that you you need to when you're working near a volcano, you need to have you need to be careful. You need to it's best to work with people who know what they're doing. And you need to have safety plans. You need to have things. So when 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 Kilauea volcano was erupting in Hawaii, um, and I would go out there, um, it was very very carefully done. Um, and we had 
NARS number safety protocols and procedures so we can approach a, a lava stream or approach a, a lava pit um, quite quite carefully. Um, it just wasn't casual stuff there. So it is it is a serious business, but if you do it um, for a purpose and you have support team and you have multiple escape routes and you have safety equipment and all those other things, then then you can survive it. Now, in the case of earthquakes, uh, since you can't really predict them, um, my approach in an earthquake is to um, observe. And part of observing is to get myself in a position where I can observe. So if there's an earthquake right now, I know where I would go and what I would do to write it out. Um, the thing you do not do is run outside. Um, if an earthquake is, is big enough to be serious, your ability to even know where up is, is compromised. So it when the earth, you know, go ahead. That was going to say, it kind of messes with your equilibrium a little bit, right? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And it, it's, it's, it's a wild ride, but, but you can tell it's coming if you can pay attention because the, the, the P waves that come through that and you just wham, right? All back. That's the S wave hitting. And if you if you time the difference between the 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 P and the S, the, the little da, 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 and then the wham, where you get the start of seesawing back and forth, it's it's very similar to like the you know the game you play with with lightning and thunder, right? Where you 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 see the flash and you count a thousand one, a thousand two, a thousand three thunder and say oh three seconds, and then you can determine how many kilometer, how many miles away it is. Um, there's a similar thing that's done for earthquakes. Um, in in the case of so in the case if I use it, I guess if I use it in in, in imperial units, um, uh, five it takes um, five seconds for it takes sound five seconds to go um, a mile. Um, if I use a imperial units there, and if I'm doing, or or you say that that's about um, uh, three seconds for a kilometer. In the case of of earthquake, the 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 pressure waves that come first um, it precede the 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 S or surface waves. Every second is 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 five miles or eight kilometers. So. So in the case of like the Turkey quake, you know, I, we had about we had about four seconds of of vibrations before the thing hit, which told us how far away the actual epicenter is. Um, so, so when the earthquake starts, you you begin to count. You look for a place to be, get safe when the pressure wave hits, and when you when it when it when we when you have that second pulse come through, um, at that point. You then you know write it out, but you now know you got a pretty good ef crude estimate as to how far away the epicenter is, and knowing the faults, you could even get a good idea of where the earthquake was and its size, right, based upon that sort of thing. And then you watch, you, know, you watch stuff like in this particular room. I would know again. This is the sort of thing I do by by habit, but I I just say, okay, if the earthquake happens, I'd be on there. I'd be watching this way of the room and see how the room is twisting as the earthquake you know goes goes through because um, if you're there you might as well make observation you might something <laughs> yeah. than, than freak out right nah. um enjoy it as best you can now we do got some questions in the chat but one of them sure. is uh i guess because it relates to the earthquake is uh bill hicks was asking why shouldn't you run outside in an earthquake well um in, in a big quake by the time you can run outside um uh, the, the the quake first of all is, is beginning to die down, you know, or it, or it, its intensity is less, um, and and the problem with buildings is that they you know, they're attached to the ground, at least the ones that don't fall off their own foundation. So the building starts, the building and the ground start moving in tandem. So the the shear between the building and the ground is moving. They're kind of moving next to each other, and the worst thing that happens is that the earthquake stops suddenly. Or, or dies down suddenly because at this point the building's got four momentum and it's going to go to the next swing while the ground stays the same so the building is sheared you so it's like you you get the building oscillating with the ground and the ground stops and the building keeps oscillating so what happens is the outside things the outside edge begin to crumble 
that's where the walls the awnings and the rock or whatever is masonry or whatever starts falling down because now the building is coming back and forth while the ground is relative still vibrating but but much less so you 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 generate up this resonance in the building where the building's walking back and forth ground and the ground starts slowing down so you have now the the ability to 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 try to run outside because you can now locate yourself and, and try to go there but just as you're getting outside the edge of the building begin to crumble down on top of you because the shear forces there so in the in the turkey quake that was in in 1999 it was in the blue mosque um the destruction outside was really quite profound of stuff, the tiling and so forth that come off of the walls. And the fact that the, you know, the congregation, whatever, that was hanging around for their, you know, meet the infidels uh, uh, thing. I say that in jest, but it was basically, they had a thing, <laughs> uh, they had a thing saying, you know, welcome non to the mosque and uh, kind of a meet and greet sort of thing. And, and you know, the, there was imam was, was there uh you know talking with people the earthquake happened and everyone fled out of the room and i so part of the thing is i'm and now because the blue moss is one of those giant moss domes um so there isn't really a thing you can duck underneath to do but that you know i said this building's been here since you know uh, uh 1453 i think um, and if it was going to come been, down it probably would it's have. been beta tested right <laughs> yeah. I said, and and then it's like, wow! Listen to the sound because because the dome, um, unlike in churches, mosques have these very tightlings so they don't they don't put like all this iconography and gargoyles and stuff like that. It's the insides are very clean sound wise, so that so the sound of the dome, boom, 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 as the as the earthquake is really rolling around, was really quite fascinating. There was a chandelier in the center. They had chains on it and it was rocking back and forth but but the main thing was the sound inside was quite impressive um speaking of the speaking of the sound somebody in the chat was asking uh they said my question for landon is uh would a rotary woofer setup i know it costs thousands be able to recreate the feeling of that infrasound i i think so i mean i think you could try to reproduce that uh there um it, it's 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 difficult because you also have the the vibrational stuff as well, the high harmonics. So I imagine you could, but it's difficult, right? It's not it's not going to be something your home theater is going to do. To, do you think to that? Produce. Do you think that that uh, you showed me a picture um, maybe a few weeks ago of, of a of a circular sort of woofer setup yeah. for testing? Pot. Yeah. Do you think something like that would that that place could they recreate? I mean, I think they they had the kind of capability, the power, and the do that. Um, one of the things I would also do is I would have a water tank and I would have uh, you know, piezoelectric pulsators inside to get the water resonating as well. You want a mass sloshing around as well. That would be, that might also help. Oh, yeah. But anyway, so as I say, that there's, there's things to do in a quake. If you, if you have to be in an earthquake, you might as well, one, make sure you're safe or move to a safe place or crawl to a safe place or as safe as you can. And then write it out, right? And so the so there's a number of people that that were injured running out of the mosque where stuff on the outside was falling on them, right? Because they could by the time they could get out and and flee, people that were trampled with each other were hit by objects, you know, coming on on the side. Um, and like they're the they're poor. The that, yeah, on the outside edge, the tiling and some of the stuff, you know, fell. Oh, you know, uh, sort of it's the a, the. the... Just the extra stuff, the decorations yeah. and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Stuff. So, sort of stuff there. Some of that stuff came out. Um, and the, the, sorry, the imam was actually, he was, a, he was, he was a, a kind of blind. I mean, he was kind of infirm, kind of blind there. And I could tell he was kind of distressed as to what's going on. Um, and so, being inside the dome, I basically crawled over to him and said, okay, he, he, he understood enough English saying, you're okay, we're fine earthquake we're fine stay here stay there you know but he telling them just you know he fell on the floor anyway so so it's like stay here you're okay don't because he couldn't really see much he couldn't hear much but he gets at least like a yell at him you're okay stay where you are um and afterwards you know he, he I, I helped him up and he was very grateful and so forth and he wondered where is everyone else 
where's my bubble? I said, well, we're the only ones here. I mean, <laughs> we were the only two left inside the mosque. And he said, did they all ran out? I said, yeah. Uh, he, he, he said, they, they fled, they left. So he went outside and he harangued the crowd. And what I gather, because my Arabic is very poor, was he basically said, you know, you were in the mosque. You could have been under Allah's protection. And you ran out and you left this infidel in here to help me out. You know, shame on you. <laughs> I, didn't, I was just trying to be nice. To them. Anyway. They even so, say, so, say now that you're not even supposed to stand in the doorways during an earthquake. Yeah. So. Yeah, and in case of the mosque, you don't really have kind of... Yeah. I mean, there was doorway archways, but it was, you know, you might think the dome isn't just one giant door. <laughs> so that's sort of... <laughs> But and I, I see the pit monks stopped out. Uh, <laughs> hey! Um, so, yeah, so pit monks there again. If you contribute to his fund for uh, the hernia surgery, so he has less of a hernia, and if you could also help him with his documentary, you will be the beneficiary of that because the man has a, has a great story to tell. Yeah, what do does. you mean, less of a hernia? <laughs> well,. So they only just the surgery is not to give him a hernia. He already <laughs> has a hernia. It's to reduce the hernia. So it's a hernia reduction, right? It's an anti-hernia surgery. You don't give him a you don't, yeah. You, case, you have a surgery to create someone you get hernia. half the hernia removed. You get half later. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 going to be yes. You want a you want a hernia reduction surgery, not a hernia expansion surgery. And he said in the chat he would suck all the balls for anybody who donates. Yeah, very, so. Very generous offer from Pimp Monk. <laughs> yes, he, he does Master not discriminate on the number. <laughs> Zero, one, two, three. He, 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 he'd do them all. Lay away hernia surgery. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure if you have three balls, he'll be extra excited. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, damn it. Um, I do have another question. Uh. Please ask Landon if, he, if he's ever, ever been to Iceland and seen the spreading zone. Mm. Yes, Iceland's an amazing place. Um, their volcanoes are pretty cranky. Um, no disrespect to Iceland. Iceland people are nice. And it's really nice. Uh, I really like the geothermal energy and, and, the, and the ancient civilization stuff that's there. It's really a fun place. But, but Icelandic volcanoes are less... They're, they're not as understood as some other volcanoes. And so... In general, like uh, I, I try to stay away when they're erupting because I don't understand <laughs> them as much. Um, so that'd be my thing: is if you don't know what you're doing, don't go near volcanoes and don't roast marshmallows. That was yeah, an but, but, that but, was a but, PCA. Iceland had some spectacular volcanoes. It's spectacular you, geothermal era. It's just an area that I don't know less about, so I tend to stay away. There you go. Please ask Landon, has he ever tattooed a midget from Africa named Blackie McGee? <laughs> so have I, ta I have not tattooed anyone. Um, so the answer would be no. <laughs> so people are just trying to find shit that you haven't done. Like they're just like, oh it's man, probably this a shorter done it list at this point. Yeah, yeah, right. Yes, I have not. I mean, I. Um, so what's Lennon's favorite comic book? Look, character? you need to seek out Blackie McGee and get that off your bucket list immediately. <laughs> <laughs> but, apparently, but apparently, you know the guy. <laughs> I think. I think for comic book characters, classic comic book characters, uh, Spider Man was something I remember as a kid. Before it got a, kind of weird. Um, I understand that because people are showing me the recent modern Spider-Man comics. So, you know, Here's comic a, you're talking, yeah. if you're talking about like action comics now in in comics as in newspapers, um, I uh, I really uh, there's a number that that I that I, I really enjoyed. Um, Bloom County is one of my favorite comic strips, and one of my favorite characters in Bloom County is Bill the Cat. And, and whenever Bill Cat would show up in Bloom County, that was I was quite happy that I, I, I yes, he's he's Bill the Cat epitomizes all that's cats. Bill the Cat can't help that he's ugly, um, 
and he doesn't <laughs> care and he's you know he's more cat-like than something like a garfield price of cute so here's here's like my my favorite like comic strip style stuff oftentimes growing up was like uh fireside and mm. dilbert mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. like I, I still remember reading like dogbert's top secret guide to success and all that but you have an interesting story about dilbert as well I yeah think. um so I was at a dinner with scott adams and we were talking about lava Rand, which is this geeky thing i did about generating cryptographically strong seeds for 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 random number generation um using lava light lamps we use lava light lamps and later on refined lava light lamps and that technology to to you know do stuff for for generating um basically intractably predict um random stuff um for for cryptography anyway so so the we were discussing you know lava you know lava ran and lava lights and 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 of course there were actually serious questions about you know things like fluid turbulence and digitalization and and curricular caches and whatnot so it was a complex sort of thing and you know i was mentioning the fact that random numbers um you you can't tell by looking and of course an homage to the the beatles song you know i said for example Nine 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 is just as random as blah 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 blah, right? Right? And and of course, you know that and yes, there were several people who went and did the number nine, number nine. If you don't know what that is, listen to the white album. Um and so but that's I think I said you that I said in fact you if a if a random generator cannot generate nine 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 number nine that number right in fact we had a, we were talking about well how many nines how many number nines does does john lennon say in, in that in that song anyway but i said that number a random generator has to be capable of generating that you might look and say that doesn't look random but again you can't kill by looking so if you go on to dilbert a couple of them, i got a, i got a i got a, a comic and a mail that was signed and it's when dilbert is sent to to hell um, where he has to go to the basically accounting hill, and and the accounting trolls are, are there, <laughs> and there's this troll that basically is is generating random numbers, which is sort of something that people say that that accountants do, and he's saying nine 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 nine, and Delbert you know, says the problem is you can't tell by looking, right? So you could say that that I've been essentially a a subject of a of a Delbert cartoon. <laughs> That's, Damn, that's pretty. Like you've 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 been a subject of a lot of different things. I've heard so many stories. It's hard to even know which ones to ask you because been in part of clandestine book hiding operations at Google and all sorts of. Things. Yeah. So so um, you know that 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 the Googleplex that they talk about was originally Silicon Graphics, and so I was there. I was there, you know, for for a stretch at Silicon Graphics when it was a great company that everyone wanted to do, and it was like a big thing and. And involved in all kinds of cool movies and stuff. um and they designed so the building the googleplex is actually designed by silicon graphics people um that that campus and we the silicon graphics had a, a thing called vrml which is virtual meta uh, reality language where you could describe a building and, and go through it in, in in with that time you know uh, virtual reality goggles and see the buildings and and injuries were allowed to go in and take the initial design and tweak it. So there's a lot of unusual stuff on that campus because people with various senses of humor did things like the back of the campus has a has a curve, which actually is a Bezier curve. And the parameters of Bezier curve are prime because, well, you know, you're going to make a weird curve. You might as well make it an interesting curve. Um, and we made, we, we constructed, added, we put building numbers that weren't consecutive with the rest of SCI campus. So it was so one of the buildings would be 42 and there'd be a 41 and a 43 because, you know, they're the twin primes around 42. Um, and inside building 42 still to this day is a heavily annotated um, copy of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy that's, that, that Adams, um, um, that, that it was done, Douglas Adams, 
put in there. We, he gave it to us and we, we placed it in the building. Um, and still to this day, the Google people have not found it. Now, some people that know where it is, and uh, but we're not telling them. So they have not done a careful job of accounting for all the volume in that building. And in fact, this I can't I can't really claim to this. I just know generally sort of where it, what it was. But the but the the people who did that um, there was a, there was one of the guys that was involving in tweaking was a magician. And he was really good at optical illusions. So, so for example, if you go to the campus, you'll see weird stuff like there's there's a there's a office with a door that leads out into, into nowhere, that kind of stuff. He was he was influenced by the Winchester. But anyway, there was a there, in Building Forty Two has some some things that are it's not obvious you're being fooled, but but people look at it and don't know what they're seeing because because magicians are masters at understanding the fallacy of perception oh yeah i i are you able to say which magician it was uh no i don't think he's he okay. was he was he would make, he would call himself probably an amateur uh, okay. magician but but he was he was very good at doing things and you didn't know that a magic magic trick had been performed on you and then he would say what just happened and you would just give something completely opposite because <laughs> he, he was <laughs> yeah. good at that misdirection because most people do not pay attention um that's i guess that's the, the word so so um so that's one of the things that's 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 there. The other another one that I did was was part of is out in the center of the campus near where the dinosaur is, and they have a T Rex. And you go there, you can see this concrete turd, this dinosaur turd there, that's next to the T Rex. But when you're that area, and you look over towards the to the cafeteria, there's a bunch of beams, wooden beams that look like they're kind of jumbled in spots that are that they can put a tarp over to give shade, but but Generally, they, they, they don't. So there's a bunch of beans there. And the, the, the challenge is, why are the beans in place the way they do? What does it mean? Why? The, the, the beam placement is not random. So, so you go to, again, go to the center courtyard out in front of the main cafeteria, and there's a bunch of beams or wooden, you know, uh, girders and so forth. And they're in this range in this spot. The question is, why are they the way they are? The, the, the method that was done, um, one of the virtual reality rooms where we do like sound stuff, um, it, 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 the, the, we have these soundproof rooms where, where we would do sound rated items. And so the discussion occurred in that room and the, and the, the thing that was done, it, we decided how the beams are going to be placed and then went out and adjusted the, the, the virtual model. So the beams were like that. So there's never been a digital record of why. Um, and we made sure it was done all, all done oral with a small group of people inside a, you know, basically otherwise a sound room. And then it's been presented. And that's one of the things that still to this day, you know, that, that I used to tell when they would, you, if you got to hear do a, a an interview, they have someone who tries to take you around and 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 show you the campus and it's like dude you know you should have me take you around and show you stuff and but anyway the, the challenge has been and google still hasn't solved it right you can't google and find out why the beans are the way they do um and there's very some smart people have been trying to figure out yet to solve it so it's one of those mysteries on the google campus that silicon graphics left behind Now, at some point, someone might might solve it, and if they get if they get it right or even close to right, we'll say, "Yep, yeah, you know, you're you're on the right track." I bet you that's just like irritating some people. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, it's it's, it's been really that sort of thing. But but I, I the thing I caution Alphabet is remember that Silicon Graphics thought they were too big to fail as well. Don't learn a lesson from Silicon Graphics and don't go down that. That road hopefully they'll learn from those mistakes as well as the cool stuff while we're on the topic of tech companies um how about that huawei 
Mm. <laughs> Mm, yeah, yeah. How about those? Um, it, it, I have been known at a standards meeting to, re this is even a number of years ago, to refer to them as the intellectual thought property theft company. I don't say the, that, that word, the H word. Um, mm, I refer I've to them heard, as the intellectual uh, property theft company. And that's probably as far as I should go. <laughs> <laughs> fear of incriminating myself or, or no, angering just, the wrong people uh yeah well yes there's there are other people that are handling that that process but well i've heard some yes. people recently uh defending them as you know like it's just the u.s trying to knock down this startup company who's doing really well and they're just jealous of all the advancement in china and um yeah i can i can tell you this that the Canadian government um, is not going to sit there and say to that lady they arrested, oh, sorry for the convenience. Oh, no, they'll they, definitely say sorry. They'll, well, they'll... <laughs> she... she um, okay, yes. That's, <laughs> sorry that's for they're, the they're, they are, they are Canadian, right? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but they, they might say sorry that you are going to spend hopefully the rest of your life um, in... In, in prison, they they understand what she's done. Um, there's hints about it in the press, but yeah, uh, the Canadians, you know, there it would be very easy for them to say, "Oh, we we misled by the 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 ushers below in the, the the country of the south and 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 race." But no, Canada understands what's at stake, and um, they're not they're they're not doing what they're doing because they're toting the line. They're interested in justice as well. Somebody in the chat said, uh, ask Landon about Xiaomi, which I guess is a different consumer electronics company in China. I don't know if I pronounced that right. I don't know anything about that, the deals with that, that company other than its, its, its name. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I know that that company had, you know, for example, the, the particular company that we've been talking about that's been mm -hmm. the subject of, of Canadian action, as well as Australian action and American action and New Zealand action, and sometimes Britain, British action, but they they kind of been back and forth in other places. Um, but subsidiaries, and those are also interesting companies. Also, it was asked in chat by uh, Sand, who does all the graphics for our channel, has done does all the uh, intros and stuff like that. Um, how did you and Pimp become friends? I've heard it many times, oh. but if it, no one's heard it, I think it's an awesome okay. story. Oh, so 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 two people. Um, it was it was Jacqueline Gwynn that I had uh, interactions with through through um, Richard Dawkins, um, and it was Jacqueline Gwynn that introduced me to Pimp Monk, and she um, uh, gave Pimp Monk his first start. I mean. Um, it's very difficult to get out of the small number of digits audience. And yeah. Jacqueline Glenn um, believed in Pimp Monk, and I had introduced to her, so she said, hey, you know, check out this guy named Pimp Monk. Um, even then, you know, it was like, you know, don't, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, doing things and so forth, but you ought to check out this Pimp Monk. And so I did. And thought he was, I not even I thought he was funny, but I also thought I was impressed by the fact that what he was doing was not scripted. Mm -hmm. He was just he was improving, right? He was a lot of stuff he does isn't he doesn't read from a script. He just reads from who he is, and and or he gets into character, and and that's the, you, so so that's what I sort of impressed me about it. But that was that was the. The, the, the thing was Dawkins to to um, Jack McLean and to Pitmonk. There you go. <laughs> was that the story you wanted? But, but yes. Yes, no. Exactly. <laughs> and as many other people that, that, that have been noticed, uh, I'm I'm he's one of the people I hope that you know he gets the he gets his chance to to do stuff because again I think one of the things that that if you watch his show. 
Pen Monk is Pen Monk, right? He's doing he's doing stuff. He isn't sitting there scripting stuff. It's live. It's 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 fresh. Um, and when he gets on fire, my right, boy, you know. And you you just see, you know, I I've been at times like these, um, get in a taxi cab ride with Pen Monk, and Pen Monk starts interacting with the taxi cab person, <laughs> and, and everyone's up there busting out laughing because because he has the ability to say that right thing at the right time. Is like, where did you come up with that? He's just Pimlin. So check him out and and contribute to his uh, a hernia reduction or anti hernia operation. Yeah, I'm hoping he comes down this way one day because he's he, he's one of the YouTubers I do definitely want to meet. Um, just because I think it'd be just a day full of fucking fun and yeah, wild craziness. Yeah. So yeah. I, I even I, prepped my wife. I was like, Pimp might be coming down one day. If so, you probably won't see me for the rest of the day. Just to let you know. So Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I think, I think Pimp would like action. I think he, I don't know how he's good at it, but I know that, by the way, I, I have a high respect for really skilled axe throwing. That was one of the things on the farm that, that there, I was not, I was only a kid, so I wasn't that coordinated as well. But the people who could throw axes on on stuff were, I'm, they're impressive, right? It's a lot of fun. Like, it's, it, yes. uh, not like on to my horn, but like we get kind of bored at work now, and we start just coming up with ways to do trick shots. And sometimes we just it, it just some of the stuff we just do is just like how we have not hurt ourselves yet. It's, it's really <laughs> yes. amazing. So. Yeah, I mean, my, my mom's big thing is, is is don't be stupid, don't <laughs> don't you dare come up with a dumb energy in, in injury, right? <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I, I know that you're you're you teach stuff and you teach safety, yeah, as well as fun there. So so it would be a, a fun thing to do. But yes, have you, ever, have you ever walked away with a dumb injury, Landon, at any of your crazy adventures, <laughs> like where you're just like, oh man, this was dumb. Now I'm all messed up. Or have you been pretty lucky? I mean, I think because again, these these, these ex expeditions are done are planned very carefully, right? There there are a lot of, of logistics that go into it because we want to be we want the, the expedition to be successful. The objectives are are we want to meet the objectives and we want to be have a have a good time. So the stuff that you think is 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 dangerous now, um, we actually are are actually fairly well you know, well designed. So going to the South Pole, there's a whole and people know what they're doing and backups and, and safety margins and um and multiple people there so that it's actually a very, very safe uh thing thing to do. We've had I mean, you know we've even had if you plan though, there's there's gotta be like unexpected things like yeah, I mean, there's a travel travel. The I mean, big the big cat there that uh was yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I, I, I didn't ask for the leopard to be in front of me as I was about ready to take a piss, but <laughs> <laughs> whenever you're, whenever you're encountering a leopard at close quarters, uh, take a whiz because you can't take a flight. He, he, he's, he's faster than you. So yep. might as well get one up on him before he comes to get you. Right. There you go. There you go. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, you may have bit my face off, but I peed on you. <laughs> and, and not in that sense but yeah so the so, kelly approach to leopards <laughs> there's been you know a uh, you know people thing that happened obviously like an earthquake you don't plan for that but we've had you know um in exhibitions you know interesting things that people have done um that you have to sort of be be careful of but um like for example in in china um, a terrorist group um, set off a, a biological weapon. It was a it was a bomb that spread uh, vials of botulism toxin over a wide area when it exploded. Um, and the people who did it sent messages to us because they knew that the foreigners in the area to basically say, um, effectively, this is not what what you'll what you'll or how do they say? It? They said something like. What's going to happen is not directed at you, and if you stay where you are, you'll be okay. Without any information of what's who it was or what, and then when the thing happens, like, oh, oh wow, damn. So they um, they, no. they they just warned you like, hey, just sit tight for a second while we do this, uh, a heinous act 
on you know these people. Damn. And that they was because I. Don't I they don't want to see Landon hurt. They're like, this guy's way too cool. <laughs> well, yeah. we, Blow him we, up. We, we, we let him know. We, we treated their people with with respect and courtesy, and tried to learn the language. They're trying to learn the language, like basic words, and and communicate with them in, in respectful fashion. And they fed us. And in their culture, feeding somebody means that they are under your protection. So while we were there, because they had fed us, they were then under protection. So they made sure when they did this thing, which was not nice, um, and it was fairly. I mean, it, it's a fairly horrendous thing to do with this biological weapon that they had constructed um but you know the chinese are not big at in in in, in talking about that uh, so and the reprisals unfortunately uh as a result of that were were pretty severe the chinese did not um did not take that that attack lightly by the way that those are things that happen like okay so so planning on that thing but again we had the connections and so forth that we you know, kept safe so we got about 10 about 15 more minutes before we're going to wrap this up and we'll we'll definitely have landon on again not only just doing this but on like the regular the the, the less riff shows because i think he'd have a whole lot of fun um and i promised you that i would let you go ahead and do a rant <laughs> on uh boris jackson or johnson or john jo johnson yeah so so I have to, as part of my job, I have to follow parliaments in the United Kingdom, South Africa, and Australia because of something called Square Kilometer Array. It's a large astronomical telescope project, and I'm advising them, people, on what's happening to those governments. So I, I have to follow along on what happens in the House of Commons. And so I've, I've observed uh, Mr. Johnson and his <laughs> action. Um, I also have to say, also a disclaimer, I have relatives who are members of the Scottish Nationalist Party that have been advocating for uh, independent Scotland. Um, and I'm also not fond of monarchy specifically, and especially the, 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 the royalty, um, you know, uh, Elizabeth and her spawn. It's not, they're not my, my cup of tea. Um, but uh, today, the Conservative Party um, selected uh, Boris Johnson as the leader of the Conservative Party. And the Tories that did it, it just shows, they, they, they showed just how politically bankrupt the, the, the Conservative Party is in, in the so-called United Kingdom. Um, I say the so-called United Kingdom because I think the notion that the United Kingdom is united is, is a farce. Uh, I think the United Kingdom needs to go the way of the British Empire, um, and that you have the kingdoms of Scotland, the King of England, King of Wales, and territory of Northern Ireland, and those entities should be left to determine their own, their own, you know, path. Because yeah. um, because the, the so-called United Kingdom is a kingdom of kingdoms, right? So so it's not like the United States, right? It, it's it's you have sort of these these three kingdoms and these various territories all under there. And and even if Scotland were to be removed from the so-called United Kingdom and become an independent nation, they'd still have the queen as their 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 monarch. Um now would but, you want to see would you want to see Scotland return to having its own king or would you want to see them like become more of a like a democratic Scotland? Um if 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 I were Scottish, I would probably also not be in favor of of the Queen being a monarch. But but that's a different question, right? Do you want to be a republic or a monarchy? Is mm. is a different question than do you want England and the English government and the and the and the nitwits in Westminster determining your yeah. course, right? Um, yeah. So again, the fact that the Tories even considered Boris Johnson, let alone selected him as party leader and therefore he'll become prime minister, shows just how politically bankrupt the, the, the British Conservative Party is, right? That to say that there isn't, there aren't other people, other states and people in the Conservative Party that, that, that are, you know, if that's the best they got, no, no, no. Um, the main thing, one of the one of the things that you say, well, oh, give give Boris Johnson a chance. 
No, I'm judging him based upon his behavior, even recent behavior. I mean, this is a man who said that no Scott should be in a leadership position in in Great Britain because, you know, and, and, and the implication is, and this is something that, 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 that the Scots have, have a, there are many people who even claim to be well-educated cultural stuff that say, yeah, but they're Scotland, right? They they tend to be the butt of jokes. They tend to be disrespected. I mean, I I hear what what backbenchers of labor that sit behind the Scottish National Party say to them. Not, it's not nice. I mean, um, so the Scots just get no respect. And and take something. Here's an example. Um, you know, you can go up to Scotland and get a a, a, a pound, right? A, a red pound that has the Queen's face on it. Um, you know, on the Bank of Scotland. Go down to something like London and try to spin that. You'll find there'll be you know pubs that'll sit there. We don't accept Scottish money here, even though it's it's the same pound, right? Really? It, 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 there is a there is a there's a notion of well, but Scots. You know, you even look you even look at the kind of political humor and satire that's done on on television and how Scots are betrayed. They're not well respected. Um, and so I think that Scotland, I strongly believe that Scotland should be able to determine its own its own future. And that the notion of the so-called United Kingdom needs to go the way of, of, of the British Empire. Anyway, but Barshan himself, right, his actions as a person, I think, profoundly say that he is unfit to hold public office, let alone the prime minister. Now, there is an irony that that man is going to have regular, like weekly tea with the lady that lives off the dole, you know, Elizabeth. Uh, they'll have to tolerate other things on occasion. I think they have weekly or every other week um, tea together between the prime minister and the queen. Um, so that's a little bit of, there's a little bit of irony there, but still I, I have a lot of friends that, that live in the British Isles and I feel really sorry for them. Now, I understand. I'm an American. I'm not British. I have my own leader, bad, right? That that does weird things. That does embarrassing things. So I understand. I'm not coming from a position of well. I'm. I you know we're, we're better. No, we have our you're own. Just, you're basically just saying, hey, look, I know my house is made of glass right now. But <laughs> yes, 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 and so <laughs> and so. Uh, you know, there's a difference between, you know, with, with Theresa May, I thought she was an ineffective leader and I disagreed with stuff, but I did not believe the person's character was in question. Boris Johnson, I think, displays behavior that should have made him unfit for office. I don't see how members of the Conservative Party MPs could have put him up as one of the two candidates, let alone members of the party voting for him two to one. But then I think that shows, if nothing else, I would say to to, to voters and and you know, British voters, remember what the Conservative Party has done to you at the polls. Now the problem is, okay, and therefore what, right? Okay, so you want you don't want Boris Johnson as prime minister. Uh, so what do you want, Jeremy Corbyn? <sighs> well, yeah, I could I could see your point, right? But but just because the opposition's leader is is has as issues doesn't mean you put probably i mean pr he, he's probably one of the most one of the least fit members of parliament to become prime minister that's that's just how bad that that things have become the, the, the whole brexit stuff is and i'm not talking about pro brexit anti brexit stuff i'm just saying no Boris Johnson is not does not deserve to be listed in the list of some very fine prime ministers in the past. Yeah, but um, I mean, think about so, it this way. Think about it this way: if he's prime minister now, right, years in the future, we'll be able to look back at this period of time and as a time where he and Trump and <laughs> some other ridiculous people ruled together as sort of the bad times. Yes, yeah. So I'd say that's that's the sort of thing. It's it's and and I, and and we'll we'll see more and more of stuff. I you know I think Johnson understands how to play the media. 
he understands publicity stunts and look forward to him using these behavioral stunts to distract from the real issue. So he will he will be the character to himself because that's how he gets known while the damage is done on, on the backside. So now my my S P friends, my relatives there, see Johnson becoming prime minister as helping the cause for Scottish independence. Um, Somebody's asking, does Landon think that Boris is aligned with Euro nationalist ideology? Euro nationalist ideology. I I don't think so. I mean, you know, so she's talking about Euro nationalist that people who are who don't want the concept of the EU existing and they want their own national um I think that I think he uh believes that that um Great Britain should govern its own affairs and that he doesn't want anything anyone else to dictate what they do um so I think he does it from a point of view of independence but 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 here's a rub is that same fervor of I don't want someone in Brussels to do doesn't apply to someone in Edinburgh saying they don't want someone in 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 as Westminster tell them what to do right um yeah. if if he were I think if he were uh consistent he would say yes and the Scots we should give them the independence and let them go cuz it's not as if they're going to be they're going to be like you know throwing bombs over the wall hadrian's wall right they're they're going to be uh, you know family of nations but there is a case of a of a country a nation the nation of scotland that voted overwhelmingly to stay in the eu that want to adopt the euro and and want to put up a trade barrier across hadrian's wall that to me makes perfect sense if that's what scots want to do now Scotland and historically has been its own worst enemy, right? The, the, the only person, the only people that are worse on the Scots than the English are the Scots themselves. So Scotland running its own affairs is, is a, is, it's going to be a problem for Scotland, but the same reason why Boris says, oh, uh, uh, the Britain should not be told by Brussels what to do and bureaucrats what to do. The same thing applies to Scotland, right? But, but, but Boris is also one of the people that, that thinks that Scots are are not human enough to run their own affairs, let alone, he would, he would have no, he says, yeah, just, that, 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 he says, a Scot has no business being a leadership position within a Westminster. Why and do you think that is? That. Is it the kilts? Is it, <laughs> is it the accent? Is it because they like everything so dreary and like, <laughs> what, what is going on? Why are the Scots disrespected? Is it like, we, I, I know, they, they have like, at the wrong time? Yeah. Like, well, but you know, you have to say the same thing about the, what's the thing about the, you know, certain English and certain Ireland. Now, by the way, obviously we're not talking about everyone, right? There are, there yeah. are, there are dishonorable Scots and there are English that have profound respect for Scotland, right? It's not, it's not a, a everything thing, but, but in general, um, uh, I think it's, it's, I mean, the way that, that if you look at the history of how Scotland got entangled with England and fell under the monarch, you know, the Council of Rogues and so forth, it's a really sad territory. And there's Scots, basically Scots that sold, sold out Scotland for, for personal gain. Yeah, I mean, my, my family lineage, like uh, the McGuinnesses were the, the king's bozeman. They, they no. stood by the, the last true king of Scotland right up until the bitter end. And then they all buggered off to New Scotland here in Nova Scotia. Yeah, so, you know. <laughs> you know, and having having one of the king, you know, King George's go killed about ten percent of the people in Scotland because they were not giving them enough tribute, right? And and yeah, there has been. And this is this is like in the seventeen hundreds. This is not ancient ancient history, right? The, the, the fact. So, in some ways, if the monarchy had any shame sense of shame, they would say, you know, calling one of our men, George, is kind of a bad move. I mean, and I'm not talking about George III and what he did to, to, to us, but 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 what the Georges did to Scotland was was, you know, pretty horrific. And they should at least say, oh if they were Canadian, they would say, 
sorry, but they're not. They're English. <laughs> so, so I feel I feel all the Canadian so, Scots I, back. We just, just yeah. take all the Scots from Canada and send yeah. them back to mingle for like you know a little while. And then they'll be like, oh, sorry about that, eh? And everything will be <laughs> yeah. fine. Yeah, I know. It's, it's kind of funny because, you know, why if, if, if the Brits threw off, uh, you know, threw out um, uh, Newfoundland, right? You know, the, the, the referendum that, that, that they did where the answer was, yes, you are, you are going to become, an, you know, uh, part of Canada and, and not be a you know, British protector. That little stunt. I mean, why can't they do that with Scotland, right? They don't, they don't respect them. Well, I'll tell you why, because Scotland is, has a, has, has some very important economic wealth. Um, and also and there's a, go ahead. Probably military location too, right? Like there's some strategic yeah. value in that location. So they, they don't want to let go of that, but they also don't want to give the people that live there the respect they deserve. Yeah. And there's, there also are a fair number of members, drooling members of the house of Lords that are there by you know accident of birth that happen to be from you know called so-called scottish lords there's a bunch of there's a bunch of the 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 peerage and the you know toting sycophants of the queen that are in scotland as well that want to be british right and want to be that sort of stuff so so um yeah and you can you well i'm not a i'm not a fan of the queen either but that wave though they've really <laughs> nailed the wave like, yeah but no, I, I did a better wave. I, I, I did. Uh, so so yes, I've I've had, I've had interactions with, with her her, her grandchildren as refusing actually refusing to let that person, um, come as guest of the city, and I've 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 sworn at her son. I one of my I've yet to be able to I've yet to be able to say a foul word to her. I, I if I have the opportunity. I'm willing. Is that um, your bucket? Is that one of that's the bucket list of Landon? I want to cuss out the queen. <laughs> like, yeah. look, I shook hands with Nelson Mandela. I've braved volcanoes and sub zero temperatures. But what I really want is to tell the queen to fuck off to her face. <laughs> I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say the effort. I would, I'd probably say, um, get a real job, bitch, and stop living <laughs> off the dole. Okay, uh, everybody. Flip that, tag the queen on Twitter. <laughs> let's, let's make it happen. No, 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 but, but, but seriously, you know, I, I'm sure she's a nice human being, maybe, I think. Um, it's just that the the, 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 the the thing that she stands for, the, the, the monarchy itself, is something that, you know, our, our family as well were kicked out of, of, of Scotland in the 1660s um, because we were on the wrong side of of. of of a monarch thing. They also were, um, well, some of it also came from Nottingham in England, but the story. Uh, and so they, they are the radicals that came over to the New World and, and um, you know, a century later were more than happy to become terrorists. And uh, some of the things they did, we have stories, for example, of, of some of our relatives that uh, attacked the uh, governor of what was then Connecticut. You know, this is like the British governor. And they forced him to set his children's hair on fire oh. as a way of telling him. And one of the kids died from that. Uh, there was also a bunch of things where they would, um, they, they drove a spike into the rear of, of one of the captains. So it was a particular British captain in, in, um, was in the Ma Massachusetts area that was particularly well known for being abusive to people that he he believed to be sort of low level um low level colonists that were of high stature right so he was particularly mean to people colonists were actually were business people right and and uh, during the time of the troubles they they captured this guy in a par and they took a basically a sharpened pike and they shoved it up his rear until it came out of his came out of his mouth oh now, 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 you see, Disney doesn't tell you these sort of stories of the Founding Fathers no, right? and, and no. so forth. <laughs> there is some pretty nasty stuff that was done. And that part of the problem was that, 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 the, that the people were caught and hung um, by the colonists who did this, who did this thing. Um, in part because, you see, the, it turns out the American Revolution was not a democratic process. The, most people living in the colonies were loyal to King George. It was a minority of radicals that ended up 
doing this Declaration of Independence thing. Um, Disney doesn't tell people a lot of things, though. Like their master plan to get Mickey the Infinity Gauntlet so they can just <laughs> the rest of the... Com- He's just going to stand on top of the castle and be like, Netflix, ho-ho! Gone, gone. Just, just, yeah, yeah, just yeah, start but, wiping everybody out. Yeah, so so our, our family has a very strong oral tradition, right? So we tell stories about small things and, and what happened um, with the Salem... We're, Bad people are the victims of the Salem witch trials and of, of again a Revolutionary War and the post Revolutionary War. And it was they the one of the problems is that, that some of their some of our our relatives are really big on on blowing things up and creating havoc. Um then all of a sudden say, Oh, it's July fourth, seventeen six, okay, we're now loyal Americans. No, they were still they were still going after stuff. And and part of the problem was that um there were a lot of people in the colonies, now Americans, that would just have been as happy to to continue being subjects of King George. Um, and that was a problem. One of the reasons why the U.S. Constitution says that the president must be born, the United States can't be born abroad, is because of that. They did not want, they feared um, the majority electing a let's say a Tory as president who would then turn around and say, pardon King George, we want to become turn against them. They were, there was this real fear. And, uh, you know, in the early days, in the article of the Federation and early days and stuff, there were, there were, you know, the, 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 the Brits did not say, Oh, okay, you won. Sorry. We'll let you go. No, um, they were, you know, the, the British Navy ship would cap, capture an american vessel even not a naval vessel, just just a merchant ship and say yep you guys are are traitors and old subjects and you're now you know impounded you know just be glad we're not going to hang you for being traitors uh, so we had the war of 1812 and uh some things we did to uh canada sorry um and canada, <laughs> uh, sorry. it's you know, okay but again, most, look, look. Sorry that we had to, uh, you know, besmirch your name by, uh, you know, tamping you into doing terrible things. <laughs> yeah, and, and of course, just if you thought, it is interesting to think about if, if the bureaucrat ended the, the, the War of 1812, if they had said, oh, we're going to keep all that land in Canada that we, we occupy, um, there'd be a big chunk of, of Quebec that would be American, right? And we'd, we'd have, yeah, there'd be an interesting thing we'd have had. It all makes sense now. <laughs> we had the block of uh, the block uh doing things that of other things so it would have been yeah it would have been interesting stuff we, of course you know, we'll, we'll trade you we'll trade you we'll take alaska and you can have, you can have <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Quebec. most americans don't understand you know don't they they know about you know teddy roosevelt you know speak softly and carry a big stick in the stuff he was doing in, in the caribbean but they don't they don't tell you you won't you don't hear for example his manifest destiny to the north where Roosevelt's plan was to essentially take over central Canada, right? There was the, the problems there and make that. In fact, there were, there were, the problem is there were so many Americans moving up into that region that if they had actually had a you know, plebiscite, there would be the prairie province that would say, yeah, we're Americans, right? There would have been, U.S. would have been happy to have gone up. So, so yeah, the whole, there's a whole history of stuff that. All right, so one more question before we uh, let go. Uh, Puffaluffacus wants to know, would, Man- would Landon mind weighing in on Disney versus Redbox? Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> so, have you ever done work for Disney, too? Like, is no, it- <laughs> no, I've not. I've not worked for Disney. I've never worked for Fox. I mean, I know Redbox from the point of view of what used to have a little DVD. Maybe they still have those those DVD uh, uh uh, things where you can go and and basically it was a DVD writer where you can go and say I want this movie and it would create your DVD for you. Um, hmm. and, and <coughs> that was I mean, they knew from Redbox from. Um, but Disney as a company has has really changed from the days when Disney land and the Magic Kingdom, the so-called happiest place on earth, um, as a conglomerate and it and. Um, I think if you just if you just looked at what they've done to the Star Wars franchise, 
Uh, so, in that sense, so it's, because it's all graphics we did were for George Lucas. Oh, Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and so we did work for 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 George Lucas, which now that whole franchise is on by Disney. So that would be an indirect thing. Um, for example, I was involved in the restoration of Episode Six, and in particular cleaning up the uh, the the final scene, the fight in the in the Emperor's throne room between Vader and Skywalker. That that. Um, and in fact, if you didn't watch it today, you'll see somewhat grainy, scratchy thing because they they lost the original um, the original master. Um, you worked on Star Wars too, Jesus. Well, and, and the main <laughs> also on, on the surface, and 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 uh, based on killing stuff of the of the separation between Episode One and Episode Two, not the content. I have nothing to. I, I have no no responsibility for Jar Jar and all that. <laughs> That's not. Don't pin disavow, that on me. Disavow. Disavow. <laughs> <laughs> but but it was it was because you know, they wanted to do a re a reissue of four, five, and six, um, and so one episode one was kind of the first mostly digital, somewhat anal analog. So the building the data center that did the computation, the the fight scene, and if you know your Star Wars episode one, where where they they had the, the Darth Ball fight scene. Um, that that thing was was filmed on front of a green screen, um, and the entire scene from when they they first countered a big fight and he finally he dies. Sorry, spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> Darth Ball. Was like, that that thing that scene took forty percent of the computation to render that scene of the entire movie. In fact, that. Um, that doing that scene was actually quite difficult to cause episode one to end early the way it did. There's this weird, why is episode one in like there and in episode two start that, that kind of, because there was stuff that should have been in episode one, but because it couldn't be rendered in time, got pulled out and put in episode two for the last minute. Um, the rendering of episode one finished 17 hours so they finished the movie 17 hours before the first showing world premiere. That was how close it came. Whoa. Um, yeah, people and, don't understand. Render, rendering takes a long time, even for big companies. Like, it is... When you're rendering some of these scenes, it just takes, like, weeks and weeks. So you're talking about, is Lana responsible for the lightsaber change? <laughs> um, um, no, I'm responsible server farm not crashing. So that the thing could have been rendered the way it did. Um, now, I must say, on the other hand, when I saw the so-called episode eight, that tragedy, and for I would refer you to Galen's descriptions of of uh, of, of episode eight, because uh, he's much he's he's much more erudite in his explicatives. Is um, is there anything about the new Star Wars that you like? The, the Disney made it's like if you had to if you had to if say if a Canadian came along and said look man you just need to you just need to be nice and say something nice because there was a lot of people who worked really hard eh and you shouldn't uh, okay so so like, okay so here's I, I I seven was so and so promised I, hmm. I saw seven in terms of storyline um the thing that I was was bothering about eight was that all the storyline stuff that was being developed and then it's like the director of eight says yeah don't care. Huh, yeah, yeah, Mickey came along and said, "Script, ho ho, gone." <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, and, and and so there's a bunch of things. I mean, I they thought... violated Chekhov's gun is what happened, like in a major way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, so like in episode eight, there, there was a really interesting story arc about the the people that that supposedly are like the military industrial comp of that of that willing that wealthy life. Um, having the award where they're doing the racing of the, of the critters and and the slave, enslaving people to to basically have a good time while they profit off of war there was a really interesting story arc there that was just begging to be actually developed but they just nah you know there's a bunch of things and 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 from a graphics point of view um what i saw was really sloppy graphics now i think they're going to be able to correct some of that when it 
when they you know do the do the release. But when you saw it first in when you saw it first in the movie theater, um, you're seeing sort of the first rendering of stuff, and then they clean up stuff. So, for example, one of the things I I thought that was appalling was if you if you were there and the original you know original scene in the movie watching uh, Luke Skywalker with a, with his lightsaber. You know, instead of saying they could they couldn't even keep the, the glowing bit in line with his with his handle, right? Because obviously as an actor, he's got just his handle thing with this little spot and and they couldn't even keep that in line, right? They couldn't um and it's the way you could do it, you tell the rendering because you you flick your eye across rapidly, basically go from left to right, and you can catch what is happening because it's it's a frame dark, same frame dark, next frame. And you can catch that going to see and and he found that the alignment is really sloppy i mean they they didn't that would be like the simplest thing to do is to keep the glowy bit in line with the lightsaber and they couldn't do that right they i i think that the people who did it showed contempt for the the audience so you might say well i know that fans have a real objection to weird stuff in episode one and I mean, yeah, from storyline, it's got some weird stuff going on there. But at least the people were, that were working on the stuff, like the the pod racing, all that stuff, really tried to to present a scene that was that was there. And unless, of course, George, George Lucas came in the last minute and made grew to his changes. Um, but but episode eight was just happy from the graphics point of view, and they did things that. And I don't think it isn't like they they, they, ran, they just figured that they just released something because they knew the fans would go and see it. Um, well, I did, um, and then let people there. So, what will happen in episode nine? I don't know, um, but I'm somewhat discouraged that the art Star Wars had amazing graphics around a story that was essentially a, a space opera, right? And there was a lot of thing up like Nerkawa and, and some, some famous storytellers had, had done movies sort of like that. And it was, it was the first time taking some of those story arcs and presenting them in, in space with these amazing graphics. But it had a story, right? And I think the thing that eight missed was they didn't sit there and say, okay, seven set up these story arcs. So eight should at least do something with them. But no, yeah. they just threw it away, and that's I think is is I so I know that there's there the fans are really have contempt for the the director of episode eight. I know that he doesn't show up willingly at a at a you know comic con or place like that because he'd get booed. I, think. I would if I were <laughs> there, I would say you should have at least had a cohesion between seven and eight. If you take a direction then you present story that shows the shift rather than just ignore stuff. Um, that shows contempt for the franchise. And and so maybe if 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 Disney wants to make more money off the fans, they'll say, oh, uh, I guess eight was kind of a mistake. Let's uh, redo it. Have an alternate eight and an alternate nine. But who knows what nine is going to be? It's not obviously the, the same guy that did, 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 did eight, but... I don't know what they're going to do with nine. Are they going to? Are they going to pretend like eight didn't happen? Are they going to go well, back to back, seven? From what I understand, they're bringing back the emperor that fell in the hole at the end of the last proper Star Wars. Uh, hmm. So he's somehow alive, I guess. That's or is he a ghosty? Right? I don't know. I don't. I don't know. They're calling it something, but like the rise of the Skywalker. So I don't know what they're going to do. Is they going to like just bring Luke back? They're like, oh, he's going to be a Force ghost. Because he ascended, or so I don't know what they're gonna do. They're doing something. Who knows? Probably. Who's like? I mean, that's someone that's it. But but the, I think um, so. Back to say with with episode six and the throne room scene, the the when the throne room scene because it was the the culminate culminant scene of, of the of the four five six story arc. Um, they shot six different endings, and part of they did so was that they. There was a bit of stuff about even the actors couldn't tell you what was going to happen until it came on the screen because they didn't know which one was a real scene. There also was um, different takes where it was essentially the same set, but things went in different ways. Um, 
and and so there was very secretive as to what the real scene, which is probably how the how the um, the original master got lost. Mm. I I know if it's I don't think it was destroyed, but it's, no one knows where it is. But they have the five alternate scenes there, and that's what we used in part render because the closest we had to the original episode six Thorman fight scene was a was a third copy. Right there was a there was a um, sixteen millimeter bootleg of a of a of a second generation copy. And a, and, a, and a third copy legitimate and that was what we had so what we had to do was use other the other five alternate endings and use that background with blended in with um, the, the the characters from the stuff so so what you'll see in there somewhat is it looks like you know uh, film streaks and and darkly bits because there's only so much you can sort of clean up uh, a bad copy of but we use the yeah. other other endings so we watched so i got to watch endings where it was stuff like um um vader kills luke uh luke and vader go and together uh you know bow to the emperor and luke turns to the dark side and, and there's nothing you know various stuff like that these alternate endings that were done um in part to confuse the people who were working on the sets because remember when they see shoot these scenes there's there's not only the actors but oh, there's a whole entourage around sub, doing support work and and none of them knew what the what the actual ending was which is how part of how they kept the spoiler away but that also meant that the scene was lost so uh, what you see you can tell is not quite the you know quite the quality of the original but at least we got something there I think I think that Luke is going to show up as a Force ghost, and then the all-female cast of Ghostbusters is going <laughs> to into a vacuum, and they're going to hide the vacuum in the Indiana Jones warehouse. That yeah. So yeah. I wonder how they're going. to how they're, they're going to add vir- Well, there will the patriarchy or something like that get. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the new villain uh, for the episode. The, the whole new series. It's just Emperor Patriarchy. <laughs> but, but you know. And so, so you gonna say that you know the the, the the new bad guy, and eight they could have done a much better job of of developing that character as well. Again, so I think I think eight lost it in the story, and they did oh, yeah. a more job in graphics, which is this. But that's just my opinion. So I'd hate to cut this off, man, but this <laughs> this has been so great. We're going to have to do this again. Uh, another. I'm calling it like story times with Landon Knoll. That's that's what this is, <laughs> and it's great. Um, next time I'm gonna have to have Billy on just so. I uh, hope I hope you've been watching Billy because yeah, we're, we weren't lying. Um. <laughs> well, I just say I, I I hope people I hope people uh, can if they if they haven't clicked that no subscription and notification bell they do so click that thumbs up because the geek room can use those. You know the the algorithms that that are in place in YouTube depend upon you know you clicking those those buttons um, and of course um, I also consider becoming a patreon and also uh, with uh, mr. pump monk uh, help in his surgery to reduce his hernia and to uh, do this documentary yeah, most definitely absolutely um, we will have Landon back on Fred knots don't worry uh, trust me I have I might not have said much, but I have been listening intently. I'm just sometimes when I I'm really into something, I don't talk at all. So that's how you know I'm really engaged in something. I'm still here. I'm just yeah. like, wow, you know. So, yeah. um, thank also you. Also, shout out to the Milwaukee atheist too. There. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but thank you again for. I really enjoy being on your show, and you guys do good work, and you should get more noticed, in my <laughs> opinion. Yes. So, um, <laughs> uh, guys, again, all the pertinent links down below, but I really want you to kind of really check out Pitmonk's, um, fundraiser he's doing. So I'm hoping we can get him up that, uh, up there, up to the goal. And so he can have the, yeah. uh, surgery and also do this documentary because this documentary is going to be really great. Uh, we've absolutely. So, um, and if I was an authentic Canadian, I'd say, Paul, I'd say, sorry. 
Dean and Boris Johnson, <laughs> errors I made, if I offended your your ha- happiest Star Wars movie or whatever, you know. Um, sorry about that, but uh, we just had a good time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, guys, I'm not going to uh, chill us out anymore, uh, but we're going to go ahead and head off. And we, I will be, again, we'll be having Landon on again, uh, whether we were doing this or doing the Let's Rift series. Um, he'll, he'll be back on our channel a whole lot more. Thank you for uh, watching. Thank you, Landon, for coming on. Thank you, David, for coming up with the questions because, I, again, I have been just intently fucking listening and been trying to think of questions but i'm just like i don't want to lose focus because i don't want to miss anything so that's the that's the way i get when i'm really into something so guys no, and, and, and hi to the chat room as well yeah. thank you kindly yeah and uh hopefully billy will come back on the next one so <laughs> i think he's uh i think he's mad at me right now so anyway guys we will see you guys later thank you oh.